Speaking of it, uh, it's our great pleasure this morning to welcome uh, Anton Arafa, who will give us some tips and tricks on practical reinforcement learning, and also a practical session on stable baseline three. Anton Arafa is a research engineer in robotics and machine learning at the German Aerospace Center. Previously, he was working on uh, state representation learning at the Ensta Robotic Labs, where he co-created the very famous uh, library Stable Baseline with Ashley Hill. Now his research focus on, learn, on uh, applying reinforcement learning directly on real robots. And for this, he continues to maintain the Stable Baseline 3 library. So without further ado, uh, Antonin, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you for the introduction um, and welcome to this uh, last day of the RL virtual school and today so today is going to be a more practical session um, it's a two-part session the first part will be about tips and tricks to apply RL in practice and then showing you some example of it on real robot and the second part will be more hands-on session uh, with stable baseline 3 where we will use um, a cold lab notebook and we will have some exercise together so and the first part so RL tips and tricks is is not is about applying RL to uh, to a custom tax it's not about um, how to implement RL algorithm for that I would highly recommend you to take a look at nuts and bolts of deep RL experimentation by John Schumann which is available online so we'll start first start by showing you some best practices in RL and then how to apply it in custom task, and then we will apply that on real robot. Uh, but to start with, well, you have to know one thing, uh, that RL is hard. So here, just to show you a quick example of what I mean by that, um, here you have two algorithms, A and B, on the breakout Atari game, and both are um, run for 10 million steps. It's 10 independent seed. And you may wonder which of the two algorithm A or B is better. And the answer is that the two are the same algorithm and it's even worse than that. The two share the same code base, the same hyperparameters, the same hardware, except only one hyperparameter, which is different, which is the epsilon value to avoid division by zero in the optimizer. And this value in theory should not affect the learning, especially if you change it from 1 to the power of minus 7 to 1 to the power of minus 5. But as you can see, there's a huge difference in the learning curve. And another thing you can notice is that if we would have stopped the learning after 2 million time step or 4 million time step, we would have said that algorithm B is not working at all. So um, what makes RL hard? So one thing is that also the compared to other machine learning technique, the data collection is quite different because it's collected by the agent itself. It's not a fixed data set that you provide it, which means that if it um, encounter not interesting data, it won't update its policy to gather better data in new region. And so it will be a, a vicious cycle. Um, then, as you have seen also in, in the first graph, there's a huge sensitivity to hyperparameters, and there's even the sensitivity to uh, the, the random seed that you, you, you choose, so the seed to the pseudo random generator. And the f uh, one of the other thing is that, um, especially for model-free reinforcement learning, uh, those algorithms are quite simple and inefficient, so you need a lot of interaction with the environment to learn something useful. And last but not least, um, uh, designing a reward function that makes the agent learn and also learn the behavior that you like is uh, sometimes quite tricky. Uh, I would also recommend you for further um, reading to read that blog post, RL is hard. I put the link in the slides and, and yeah. That would be a further reading. Another problem with RL is called uh, reward hacking. So, which means that if the and if the agent can glitch your environment and maximize its reward without solving the task, without actually doing the behavior that, that you want, well, it will do it. 
And this is something that you should always have in mind and that happens quite often, especially in simulation. Uh, but to counteract all those problems, you, you can, of course, follow some best practices. And the first of the best practices is when you want to compare, when you want to do evaluation of reinforcement learning algorithm because of the sensitivity to the random set, you should always um, do quantitative evaluation. So not only do one run, but do multiple runs, usually 10 runs if you want to be uh, quite sure of the result. Um, then Another thing is, again, because of the sensitivity to hyperparameter, use recommended hyperparameters, which mean they take a look at the original paper, take a look at a tuned hyperparameter on other implementation, and start from that. And then, uh, because if you change something, you would like to reproduce your experiment, uh, I would highly recommend you to save all your experiment parameters um, maybe including the random seed because if you want to compare two runs and would like to know okay what what makes this run work and what makes this work fail uh you should be able to reproduce your experiment and all of that in fact is included in what i will present in next part in the second part which is called uh, the arezu it's a training framework for stable baseline 3 which implements um, most of the best practices and uh, of course, in RL, you should uh, know that there is no uh, silver bullet. So uh, it's not because one algorithm works in one place that it will work on all tasks. And don't also expect the default hyperparameters to work on any task. Um, again, if you want to uh, read more about uh, comparing RL algorithm, I would highly recommend you to read uh, that paper. So how to apply reinforcement learning on a custom task? The first question you need to ask yourself is, do you need RL? Because sometimes, and I think that's been already said in the talk yesterday, sometimes you don't need RL and you can solve your task um, with other techniques, other methods, which are much more suited for your task. As a quick example, if you can solve your task with a PD controller, then do it. You don't need to use fancy algorithm for that. And then the second question you need to ask yourself is, do you really need RL? Uh, because yeah, trying to make things with uh, work with RL can be really tricky. And again, if it's not suited, uh, you better use another method, especially for instance, if you want some safety, some stability uh, guarantee, probably you don't need RL. So how to define a custom task? You, you have a problem, you would like to apply RL on it, you, have make sure, you made sure that it makes sense. What do you need to define for that? So you have different components. And the first one is obviously defining an observation space. So what do you give to your agent as input? Then there will be what uh, the action space, which is uh, what does, how does your agent interact with the word? What do you um, give him? And then uh, two things come together, which is a reward function and termination condition. And I will um, dig more into detail for each of those in the coming slides. And as a general remark, uh, when you work on a custom task, always start simple. Don't try to solve uh, your task from, from the beginning. So how to choose uh, the observation space? The first thing you need to uh, be aware of is, of course, give enough information to your agent to solve the task. Don't expect it to do uh, magic and solve it with very little information. Another thing to keep in mind is with RL algorithm, um, you made some assumption and one of them usually is a Markov assumption. So you should avoid to break it. So if you break the Markov assumption, well, it will sometimes still kind of work, but it usually injure um, the, the performance. And in fact, I will show you uh, in the examples uh, how to counteract uh, that. And of course, because we are in machine learning, don't forget to normalize your observation space. Um, 
So if you know in advance the boundaries of it, you can do it. If you don't know in advance, you can use a uh, running average uh, to, to normalize uh, this, this observation. And again, this is included in stable baseline three. And this normalization is especially uh, important for on policy algorithm like PPU or A2C. So this was about choosing the observation space. The next, next thing you need to choose for a custom task is the action space. And the first question you need to ask yourself is, do you need discrete or continuous action? So discrete actions are uh, like Atari games when you push buttons, when you, you use a switch. Um, and continuous action um, is when you can, for instance, for a robot, uh, you can ask for a desired position, which is a continuous value between two limits. Uh, so for some tasks, it makes you, you, you have no choice. You can only use one of those two, but for others, you, you always you usually have the choice between discretizing uh, your space or using continuous values. And for robotics, I would highly recommend you to use continuous value because for me, at least it makes more sense. With the action space, you also have a trade-off of um, complexity versus final performance in the sense that if you're you give your agent a lot of freedom. If the action space is wide, then the search space will be uh, wider and it will take more time to learn. But because you give it more freedom, maybe it could reach a better performance. Of course, if you have some prior knowledge about the task, about uh, what limits are good, you should uh, limit more the action space and this will usually result in faster learning. And in fact, in the examples later that I will show you with a racing car, um, this was quite important to, to learn quickly. Um, and of course, all what I'm showing to you here is also a question of trial and error. So you will start with uh, some initial observation space, some initial action space, and then you will see how it's going, and then you can adjust to that. And there's one special thing I need to talk about, which is when using continuous action space, um, you need to be very careful with it. And you need really to normalize it because for continuous action space, uh, most of the algorithm rely on a Gaussian distribution. And because this Gaussian distribution is initialized with a mean of zero and a variance of one, around one usually, if you define uh, your action space with the wrong limits, you will have, uh, it will, RL will barely work or you will have weird behavior that are hard to debug. And as a first example, if you define your limits very big, like between minus 1000 and 1000, so a box space is just a continuous uh, space. Uh, what will happen because you sample actions from a Gaussian around zero with a variance of one, you will never, you will always sample action very far away from the limits. And the other way around, if your limits are too small, let's say between minus 0 0.02 and 0 0.02, then your action will be always outside those limits. So you will saturate and, and this will be uh, hard to debug. So as a general um, good practice, I would highly recommend you to have a normalized action space uh, so between minus one and one and with uh, symmetric also. If you need to handle limits, you can do that in your environment by rescaling the action that your agent give. And this would also allow you to, to have dynamic uh, limits, for instance. And to have a visual explanation of it, um, the purple curve here represents uh, the initial Gaussian from which you sample your actions. And the blue uh, blue curve here would represent uh, your action space if you define it with two small limits. And as you can see in that case, if if you do so, then you will just saturate and have um, action that are clipped to minus zero point one and zero point one, which is something that you don't want. The good news for you is all those kind of thing are included in. Um, in an AMF checker, so to check, uh, to give you some uh, recommendation for your environment in Stable Basin 3. So the next thing to choose is a reward function. 
And um, again, as I said, always start simple with your custom task. And when you start simple, you can uh, choose between sparse and shape reward. So sparse reward is giving only a reward when uh, the agent reaches the goal or succeed to the task and zero most of the time zero everywhere else. Um, and shape reward is a much more informative reward, but it may be harder to write or it, it may lead to deceptive uh, reward. And so as a general recommendation, start simple and start with reward shaping. But be, again, be careful with uh, reward hacking uh, because it may maximize its reward without solving the task. The next thing I usually do when I define a custom task is I think in terms of primary and secondary reward. So primary is something you really want to achieve. From, if you have a quadruped, you want it to walk, uh, the primary reward will be the distance traveled. And secondary reward are all the other um, thing you would like to optimize, but that not, are only, it's, it goes after the solving the task. And again, for the robots, it would be minimizing the energy. But again, you need to be careful because if you give the secondary reward too much weight, uh, then the agent will just try to minimize its, its energy, which means doing nothing. Um, and to, to make things easier to tune the weight between those different rewards, again, normalize. Um, if you normalize them, then it makes much easier if all of the reward have the same magnitude, then it much it's much more easier um, to tune the different weight between each of those. And something that goes with uh, the reward are the termination condition. So usually termination condition are composed of two things. Uh, one thing is called uh, early stopping. So stopping uh, your stopping the episode before. Um, before the end and the other one would be timeout so having a maximum number of steps or maximum time per episode um, and early stopping also prevents the agent uh, from exploring region uh, that are useless for the learning and it also may be good for um, the safety of your robot usually early stopping is is makes learning uh, faster and if you use timeouts, you need to be careful with it because um, it would break Markov assumption if you're not careful. So you, you have two ways of dealing with timeout. One way is giving the remaining time as input to your agent as an additional feature. And the other way is changing a little bit the algorithm um, to, um, to use the infinite horizon um, variant of it. And again, be careful because if uh, you use the wrong termination condition, you may end up uh, having again some reward hacking problem. Just to give you an example, if you penalize your agent at every time step and you just stop the episode when it reaches the goal or when it uh, falls or fail, uh, then it, it may just learn to fail very quickly to maximize its reward. So always be careful uh, also with the termination condition. So, so far we have seen how to define a custom task. And the next thing you need to choose is um, the algorithm. What algorithm should you start with at least? The first distinction you need to think of is are you using continuous or discrete action? Because some algorithms uh, were designed only for one of those two spaces. And then the next question you need to ask yourself is what matters for you? Does um, wall clock time training, so how long does it take to train, matter more or um, does sample efficiency uh, matter more for you? So for instance, if you have, if you have a simulation and you can parallelize a lot, uh, then probably wall clock time is uh, what you are looking for. But if you have a single robot, you cannot have uh, you cannot parallelize training and, and then you need to be very sample efficient. So if you found, if you uh, have continu continuous action spaces and want to be sample efficient, uh, then you should probably use the off policy algorithm like ACC and its uh, distributional successor, which is TQC. 
And the same way for discrete action, usually sample efficient algorithms are the off policy one using a replay buffer, uh, usually from the uh, DeepQ network family uh, and the more recent, for instance, uh, quantile regression DQN. On the other hand, if you need uh, speed, so if, if you want fast training with a parallel environment, uh, you may go for on policy algorithm, which are more lightweight also to train, like uh, proximal policy optimization and A2C. And uh, PPU and A2C work in uh, both uh, action spaces. And if you want to be even more faster or um, want to parallelize even more, then you can uh, take a look at evolution strategies as uh, what was shown yesterday. Um, okay, no questions so far. Good. I will answer anyway. I will answer more questions uh, in the in-between uh, section. So, so far we have uh, defined our custom task and uh, we have chosen an algorithm. We have followed the best practices, but it doesn't work. So what can you do? First thing you need to think of it, did you really follow all the best practices? Uh, make sure uh, to uh, yeah, go into detail in each step. Then as always start simple and iterate over it. So. Try to make something simple work and then complexify more and more your task. Another problem that may occur is that you probably implemented the algorithm yourself or you use some implementation on the web. And I would highly recommend you to use trusted implementation that are benchmark or that are widely used. Um, for instance, use stable Bayesian tree just as a, as a random example, obviously. Uh, because RL algorithms are quite hard to get completely right, and, and it takes quite some time to, uh, to fix all the possible bugs. And then one simple thing you can try if it doesn't work is, as if you remember the very first graph I show you, just increase the budget. By increasing the budget, you can at least know if it's possible or not to solve the task with the current algorithm and current hyperparameter seeking. Um, and this is mostly as, as a, to have a first sign of life for your task. Um, and, and then what you can do if you want to make uh, learning faster or if it still doesn't work, you can still go for some hyperparameter tuning. Uh, I would first recommend using the Optuna library. Um, and we, in fact, we are going to see, see that in the second part, how to do some automatic hyperparameter tuning. Also, do not really tune by hand. If uh, if you can avoid that, uh, use automatic hyperparameter tuning, which is much more efficient and which would allow you to save a lot of time. And again, uh, try to iterate quickly. Uh, have something that you can run fast and debug fast. So just as a recap, uh, reinforcement learning is hard. So you need to be aware of, of it. And as, um, as a consequence, you really need to think about if you really needed RL on your problem. Then I showed you some best practices that you can follow to avoid uh, most of the problem, I would say. And we have finished with some um, how to define a custom task. So now it's time for question. I have... So what do you mean by increasing budget? So increasing budget is how many um, time steps you give uh, to the agent to train. So for instance, in the first graph, um, I can show you back. In the first graph, uh, the budget was here. The budget was a 10 million time step. And the second question was the same thing, okay. Okay, is there any other question? Otherwise, I would continue. Well, there were some, but many of you answered to most of them. Oh, one just uh, arrived. And uh, what second no. do you recommend to use distributional, uh, distributional RL? Um, 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 so, for now, distributional RL, uh, th there's two things. Um, Usually now they perform uh, better, N not always, but 
from secure DQN is a huge improvement compared to DQN with just simply replacing uh, the objective with di distributional reinforcement learning. But in fact, QR DQN doesn't really make use of a distributional array. It's make use of it more as an auxiliary task. Um, the true uh, use of distributional array would be to have uh, to use policies that are risk averse or risk seeking, and uh, that's uh, where you would use distributional array, really. Do, do you make use of demonstration to initialize the behavior? Um, so it depends on your task. Uh, it depends also on the parameterization of your policy. Um, but what, what can happen? In fact, that's also a current problem uh, that if you use current technique, at least with neural networks, and you try to initialize it with imitation, imitation learning, and then you continue training, uh, then it will the performance will still drop afterward. And this is related to all the problem with offline reinforcement learning. But if you use different parameterization like DMP, so dynamic motion primitive, then initializing with demonstration totally makes sense and, and will make the learning much faster. Uh, can you explain again about primary and secondary rewards and early stopping? So primary is secondary reward is mostly a way of um, looking at the task. Uh, it's because usually in your reward function, you have different terms. Uh, primary and secondary reward allow you to rank those quickly and, and to avoid um, uh, having a reward function that will in fact not lead to the behavior that you expect. And early stopping, early stopping is uh, mostly uh, it's there for two things. It's there for preventing to explore a uh, region of the space that is not useful. And it's also preventing, uh, for instance, on the real robot, it's preventing when the robot falls, you don't want it to continue trying things. You want it to stop. And this is also for safety. Uh, OK, so this is done. Uh, could you extend in the explanation of adding in the observation if episode at okay? So the next question is about adding uh, remaining time to the observation if we have a timeout. Um, so for that, uh, I mean it's it's very simple. For instance, if you have your observation, which uh, is the vector of uh, ten dimension, which contain I don't know the position of your robot and the orientation. What you give as an additional input is just um, the normalized time remaining. For instance, if your episode is 100 time step, you can give, uh, well, it, you will give 100, but normalized, so one, and then it will decrease to one until at the very last time step, this feature will be zero. If the agent is not improving after 1,000 episodes, shall we then stop and look for what's wrong? Um, it's quite hard to answer because uh, it depends on your control frequency. It depends on how long is one episode. So if, like if one episode is 10 times step, maybe uh, you can still continue. Um, it's highly problem dependent. Uh, it's hard to answer just like that. Could you imagine starting to learn a policy with an algorithm? for instance, SAC, and then use it as a policy for exploration for a nozzle algorithm. Um, you mean with a pre-trained algorithm or? But sure, um, if you use off policy algorithm, as long as you explore enough, uh, then you can use anything, mostly anything as, uh, as input. Um, if you have seen Olivier talk, uh, you know that in practice, the exploration policy should not be too far from the policy that you are using at the end. Uh, but sure, if you are using off policy, in theory, you could you could use anything. And then is Optuna library working as a meta learning optimization? Um, I'm not sure to answer that. So Opt Optuna is mostly a library for automatic hyperparameter tuning. So it implements mostly two things. It implements uh, 
black box, black box optimization. And in fact, it's two parts. One part is the sampling and one part is the pruning. So stopping um, trials when they, they don't look prom promising. And as a sampler, for instance, you can just have grid uh, search or you can have a random sampler. And as a pruning, uh, you can for instance, look if your trial at this time step is uh, better or worse than uh, the median of your um, uh, of your trials. No more questions. I think then we're good to go. So, uh, so far I've shown you um, how to define a custom task and the best practices for RL in practice. And now I would like to show you some examples on, on real robots, on the DLR real um, robots, and also the challenges uh, associated with them. And the first question you may wonder is, uh, why would you learn directly on a real robot? Uh, because, well, it's well known that simulation is all you need, or maybe not. So here, it's a recent example of um, an algorithm breaking the simulation and and um, having a, um, it maximizing its reward by uh, not solving the task, but finding a better way in the simulation by breaking it. Uh, so here it's a Mojoko environment. It's meant to run, but it actually learned to roll because it's more efficient. And this is from a recent model-based uh, RL algorithm. And if you're not convinced, I have another example where you have two racing cars. Each of those are controlled by reinforcement learning. So this is a donkey car simulator, and one is passing over uh, the other. And as you will see, it's it's a perfectly normal behavior as would happen in, in real life. Perfectly normal. Um, so again, why should we learn on a real robot? Because um, simulation is obviously safer and faster to run. Uh, you can parallelize it. It's in fact very good for iterating. Um, myself, I'm using simulation when I'm tackling a new problem because I need to iterate quickly and I cannot uh, break the robot when I'm trying um, things. You have also some uh, successful example of simulation to reality. Um, I would highly recommend you to take a look at the animal, uh, the two animals papers. Uh, one is called blind locomotion, if I recall, but those require to have accurate model and also to randomize the simulation. And even with those two, you are not guaranteed that it would work on a real robot. On the other hand, if you try to learn directly on a real robot, you will have even more challenges uh, included, especially the robot safety. You cannot use the robot for too long uh, because at some point it will break or you need to be careful with it. And, and also because you cannot parallelize, you need to be very sample efficient. But on the other end, if you can train directly on the real robot, then you are sure that it will work and you don't need any model. You can, especially for model-free RL, you can directly apply reinforcement learning on the robot. And if you change the robot, um, then you can continue training. The same way from if the robot dynamic changes a bit, then it will adapt to it directly on the real robot. You don't need to uh, retrain in simulation. And as a first example, um, I would like to show you what I did on the DLR David robot, especially on the neck. So it's an elastic robot and here I'm working on the neck. So it's made of a cylinder of silicone that you can see in blue. And um, it's actuated using four tendons, which are highlighted in orange here. And what makes it a good candidate for RL is that because of this elasticity, it's in fact quite hard to model. Um, another thing that happened is um, because of the elasticity, it will oscillate quite easily. And this is a problem because you want control to be smooth and you want also the result on, on the robot to be to be smooth and not oscillating. Uh, and because it's a real robot, obviously you have some safety problem. You cannot send anything to the robot. You need to be sure that you will not break it. Um, 
One thing I did not talk about is the oscillation. Um, you have two components, I would say. One component is because of the exploration, and I will talk about that uh, in the next slide. And uh, another problem come um, from at test time, you want your final policy, your deterministic policy uh, to, be, to be smooth. And what happened is, okay. What happened is if you use uh, RL, the way it is implemented right now, and you're not careful, you will have trouble because if you recall continuous for continuous action spaces, uh, reinforcement learning is relying on a Gaussian distribution. And at every time step, uh, the agent sampled uh, some noise from a Gaussian distribution and added to the deterministic controller here, a mu. And if you do so, then you will just send high frequency noise to your robot and you will destroy the actuator. And in addition to that, in, to destroying your robot, in fact, this is quite inefficient uh, because your system, the, the real system, always acts as a low pass filter. So to counteract that and to directly use RL on a real robot, um, I've been working on a method called Generalized State Dependent Exploration, or GSDE for short. And the idea is instead of sampling some exploration noise at every time step, we sample some noise every n step or even every episode. But to uh, to be able to uh, to have some variation between the steps, uh, this noise is also dependent on on the state. And of course, for the first case on the on the left, if you have a Gaussian noise, you could use a low pass filter to uh, remove the high frequency noise. The problem with low pass filter is, is that we, it will introduce uh, some slowness in your control. And that's something also you don't want. You could also use correlated noise, uh, but correlated noise are harder or trickier to implement. And you need also to, to tune it carefully. So th that's why I'm mostly using uh, state dependent exploration. In fact, on all the robots I will show, show you, I'm using this technique. Uh, because it's simple to use, it's simple to, to tune, and it also gives you good performances both in simulation and on the real robot. And that's also something you don't want to compromise, it's that the, the final performance of your policy. So GSD is mostly to, tack, to tackle um, the, the oscillation, the, the jittery controller during exploration. But if you do so, it will still, uh, it can still lead to um, oscillation at the end. And for that, I usually use a very simple fix, which is a continuity cost, so a negative reward. And the formulation is very simple. So you just penalize uh, the difference between two consecutive actions. But again, if you do so, you need to be careful because this would break Markov assumption. So you just, uh, a simple fix is to use a history wrapper, so you give the previous action and also previous state, um, you stack previous action and previous state with the current state, and you give that as input. And usually this gives you good results, and this work, this is quite uh, general, so you can apply it to many different problems. This reward, um, as you can see, could be also directly done in the loss function, and this, in fact, that's what a recent paper named CAPS is doing. Um, so instead of including that term as a reward, it's including directly as uh, auxiliary um, secondary loss uh, when optimizing the policy. And for this continue cost, continuity cost, again, you need to be careful because if you give it too much weight, then uh, it will end up, your robot will end up doing nothing because uh, to minimize this cost, uh, you just need to output a constant action. So let's see um, the detail of the test specification here. So as um, observation, I give to the robot uh, tenant forces, so desired pose and the current pose. The action space is obviously conscious action space using the desired forces. So we have four actuators, so we, we have a 4D output. And the reward function is decomposed into two uh, terms. So the primary term is a shape reward, so the distance to the target, and a continuity cost. 
And I got two time two uh, termination condition. One is success, one is timeout. And for success, you need to be careful because um, if you stop the episode as soon as it reaches the goal, it may overshoot. So one simple fix for that is you just wait that it's at the target for a while for, for one second before stopping. The algorithm, because I need to be sample efficient, uh, I have only one robot. I'm using soft actor critic and uh, GSD for exploration. And the result is after two hours, it learns to control the robot. And after three hours, it learns to control it uh, smoothly. And this is what you can see um, is in the next slide. So two hours is still long, but in fact, you can improve that by using some knowledge about the robot. So for instance, using uh, not only learning a feedback controller, but also um, using um, uh, using a fit forward controller learned or using a model based fit forward controller and then learning on top of it. And what you can see here, it's um, the example trajectory where blue is the desired pose. Um, in orange, you, uh, you can see the result of the model based controller as a baseline. So it's smooth, but it's not so accurate uh, sometimes. And then you have the two reinforcement learning algorithm. One is using GSD and the other one is using the low pass filter. Both are quite good in terms of um, accuracy, but uh, GSD is much smoother at the end. And to give you a visual uh, of what it looked like on the real robot, I have a video. So here on the screen, you will see uh, the desired pose and uh, the current pose of the robot. And this is what happens if you send uh, Gaussian noise to the robot. So here, the control frequency is not too high, so it's okay -ish, but uh, it's something that you don't want to, to send to the robot, especially uh, because, yeah, you will break the tendon, you will break the motors, and I've repaired that robot enough to know that I don't want to break the robot uh, anymore. And on the other hand, so this is the very beginning of training, but after two hours, um, uh, this is what you, you can get. After two hours, so it reaches uh, all the poses quite quickly and it's, it's quite smooth. And this is directly trained on the real robot. I'm not using any simulation. The, the vis visualization is mostly here for debugging purposes. And it's also, uh, it's also um, react nicely to perturbation. So it's not oscillating too much. And this is what you can get. So after two hours, uh, three hours of training for completely uh, smooth. So I see there was some question here in JSD. Why are you taking a random noise every n step instead of renormalizing every noise by one over n? Um, I'm not sure. The main issue is uh, with sampling uh, every step is is that you will it does the magnitude. I think here you're talking about the magnitude, but the problem is not the magnitude. The problem is uh, sampling at every every end step. It's the frequency of your of your noise. I would say. About continuity costs, would it make a difference to replace the action of an environment by new action consisting in the derivative of previous comment? or to keep Markov property a current value of comment on which new action act to the observation. Ah, okay, so yeah, that's that's also possible, but again, you will, you may introduce some slowness. If So the I think the question here is, can I replace once if instead of controlling my robot by position, controlling the robot using velocity or higher or, or acceleration? So it's possible, it will also lead to smoother um, result, but it will it may introduce slowness, as, which is something you don't want, and it's also changing again a, a bit your problem. But it's it's again totally possible, and it depends on what you want to solve. We also have a question on matrix. Mm -hmm. um, I read you. Do you have any recommendation on applying reinforcement learning to problem with an evolving environment states? For example, at time t, you have n binary descriptors of your environment. Mm -hmm. And then at time t plus 1, you may have a larger number of binary descriptors. Mm. 
Um, so, yeah, I have not really done that yet, but what I would recommend probably is is um, starting with a bigger um, observation space. So, uh, and then starting training, yeah, with uh, less features and then including new features, but uh, keeping the state uh, size constant at least. But I've I've never experienced with that, so I I'm not I don't know. <laughs> Ensuring the continuity in common was important because it was commanded in position. Um, that's true, but this is true for uh, anything. Like if, even if you command uh, the velocity, you still want to have a, a smooth uh, control. You don't want your um, your controller to output jittery actions. And in in fact, also having. Uh, this also would minimize the energy used, which is always something you would like on, on a real robot. So this was the first example. So learning uh, on an elastic robot. And the next example I would like to show you is uh, learning to drive in minutes and learning to race in hours using, well, a racing car and also a simulation uh, named the donkey, uh, donkey car simulation. And here, the main challenge is um, that this robot has a very minimal number of sensors. So it has only uh, access to the image using a camera, onboard camera, and, and, to a sp and it has a speed sensor uh, only for the sim in the simulation. So here, it would be quite hard to apply, for instance, model-based um, learning, model-based control. Um, because you would need to create a map uh, of of your uh, racing track, but in fact, in practice, you don't want to to be tied to a map. You would like it to work on any possible uh, racing track without uh, retraining or without remapping everything. Especially if you have onboard um, computation, you, you don't have too much memory to store everything or to compute everything. Another challenge is. Uh, because of uh, the camera and it will be outdoor, you have a huge variability in the scene that you, you will see, both in terms of uh, the shadows that you can get from the sun, the different lighting, and you may also have other car passing in front of you. And in fact, I tried to solve at first uh, this problem with classical computer vision, and I had a hard time, uh, especially with shadows uh, handling all, all possibility. Um, again, we don't want our robot, we want our robot to have a smooth control and to look uh, nice when it races or when it drives. So we want to avoid oscillations. Um, and we have also a limited computing power, both um, in terms of the onboard, um, it's just a Raspberry Pi. And in terms, we can still use external computer to train, but my computer is just a laptop without GPU, so I also wanted to uh, have uh, minimal, minimal computing uh, power on that. And last but not least, you have communication delay. So because it's over Wi-Fi, uh, you may have some delay, and this would break, again, Markov's assumption. So one simple fix is to use a history wrapper to stack uh, several uh, states and, and counteract the communication delay using that. But the main challenge here is uh, learning fast uh, from images, and you could think at first, okay, I can I can learn end to end. I have a CNN and directly map uh, images to actions. But if you do so, you will have different problem. One of the first problem that it will take quite a long time to train, and the other problem um, is uh, that you will not be robust to to many different uh, scene. And you, you are not sure, in fact, of what was learned by your CNN. So a uh, simple way to counteract that is to first learn to extract features, then freeze this feature extractor, and then just learn the controller on top of those features. This is called state representation learning. And what I'm, um, in fact, using in practice on the robot is uh, something very close to what was present um, called augmented autoencoders. Um, you can find the link here in the references, in the slides, um, which consists in, it's an autoencoder, so you try to reconstruct the original image uh, having an information bottleneck 
which here is uh, uh, it's we call also that uh, the latent representation. So this is the features that we are going to use at the end with the controller. And the way it works is you have the original image, which you can see on the top uh, left. You augment it, so you, you do random augmentation, could be adding shadows, uh, changing the light, uh, removing some cropping, uh, removing some part of the image. And then you try to reconstruct the original image, so the, the non-augmented image. And that way, you will learn something that is invariant to all those uh, transformations here. The other nice thing about using an autoencoder is that you can directly take a look at the reconstructed image and see if the latent representation um, includes all the information needed to here to, to drive or to race. And here you can see that the central line is here and also the borders were well encoded. So you you can you are pretty sure of uh, that it should work. And again, using that technique by just looking at um, at the uh, at the representation learn or, or the reconstructed image, you can also continue retrain and collect more data to to train it uh, better. And in fact, there's a bit uh, there was a lot of uh, development in self-supervised learning and especially for reinforcement learning uh, in the recent years. And I would highly recommend you to take a look at the SIM uh, paper if you want an overview of of the recent constructive constructive uh, method to learn features. And the other nice thing, so doing so, you can you have to do the training only once, and then you can freeze the encoder, and the encoder is much faster to use both on the Raspberry Pi on, on the computer to train uh, an agent. Again, using that technique, you don't need to, uh, the agent just need to learn to control and not learn to extract uh, features which makes in, in practice the learning much faster. So learning to drive takes um, around five to 10 minutes, but learning to, to race is, um, takes around two hours, but learning to race faster than you might take six hours. And, um, but it's still quite fast, I would say. So how does it look like in practice? So on the right, you have um, the real uh, camera with the augmented image, which is here mostly Gaussian noise on it, and then uh, the reconstructed image. And you can see that it's quite challenging because you have a big highlight from the sun and the track is poorly made with some gaffer tape. So the observation space is a latent vector, so the latent representation from the autoencoder. Uh, plus for the uh, racing car, I give the current speed also as input and to tackle a communication delay. And because I'm also using contingent cost, I give a history, uh, usually just the previous uh, time step. So the action space here is just the steering angle and the throttle. Um, and in fact, not giving the full uh, steering, um, like limiting more of the steering angle is quite beneficial because you know, for, for instance, for racing, you you won't need to 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 change your uh, direction too much from one time step to another, and in fact this allowed to learn much faster and much smoother behavior by limiting the limits of your steering angle. Um, so the reward function for uh, for racing is just maximizing the speed, um, and uh, again uh, being smooth. So uh, being fast and smooth, and it's a good proxy for uh, racing, in fact. Um, as termination condition, obviously, I stop the car when it crashes, and there's a timeout uh, also for, for training. Again, um, because we want to be sample efficient, we have only one robot. I'm using our policy algorithm, so soft actor critique or a truncated quantity critic, which is the distributional version of it, and GSD for exploration to have a smooth behavior. And um, I have two videos to show you. One video is uh, on the real robot, so training, training and testing on the real robots. This is at home. 
So it took around 30 minutes. It took a bit more time, uh, mostly because this car is 20 years old. So the steering is, is not that good anymore. And there's a lot of play in it. But at the end, you can see that it drives uh, along the track. And even with um, sun highlight, it still managed to, to, to complete the turn. So this was um, on the rear robot. And for racing, um, I want to show you an example of it. So this, this was an online race uh, on the donkey car uh, community using the donkey car simulator. And here um, you have two cars. One car is uh, using imitation learning, so behavior cloning. And the other one, the racing robot, is is using um, reinforcement learning. And the main difference between imitation learning and reinforcement learning is that reinforcement learning can uh, will also work in where uh, where the expert doesn't know. It it has also learned to recover. And as you will see, what will happen is that the behavior cloning uh, car is is working quite well, but it bumps into a corner and then doesn't. Uh, uh, know how to recover and then we'll crash into the wall. And I'm also. And then you have the the racing car, which is uh, which which also crash, but which which will recover from from it. And I think it's quite pixelized, so I will stop the demo here. Um, I will present the last example and then I will answer all questions. So the last example I would like to show you is learning to walk directly again, uh, directly on the rear robot using the BERT quadruped. Um, and this, this quadruped is quite different in fact from what you may have seen uh, already. Uh, because it's it's very elastic, so the 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 spring are uh, very soft compared to other robots, and um, this makes it uh, in fact more challenging to to apply uh, model based control on it. But it's quite interesting because using soft spring, you can store energy in uh, in those uh, those springs and, and use it later. Uh, of course, for working, you can use a hard-coded solution, so using from the central pattern generator, but it needs some tuning. It's probably not the most energy efficient, and it will probably not give you the fastest gait. And this would work for working, but if you want to turn, then you will need okay, to, to tune it again, whereas for reinforcement learning, for instance, you can just reuse the same model, the same setting, and just apply it on the real robot. And there's additional challenges with uh, this robot. So again, the robot safety, in fact, the motor are quite powerful. And because of the spring, it can front flick and back flip very easily, which is obviously not good for the electronic and the hardware. It requires also some uh, manual reset and uh, as some con communication delay because we are communicating over Wi-Fi to the, to the onboard uh, controller. So to counteract robot safety, uh, you will see it has some bars to completely prevent it from backflipping and front flipping. For the manual resets, uh, we have a basic recover strategy, plus we are using the treadmill to, uh, to get it back to position. And as you may expect, so the observation, what I give to the input to the robot are the, some information about the joint position talk, um, the internal uh, measurement unit uh, sensor gives you some information about the acceleration, some information about the orientation of the robot, and because to tackle the communication delay, and because I'm using also continu continuity cost, I'm um, using a history wrapper. And um, I'm here directly controlling uh, the uh, six uh, joints, so the motor position of, of them. And the reward function is decomposed into a forward distance and some secondary rewards, which ensure that the robot would walk straight and also minimize the continuity cost. So walking straight means uh, both being close to the center uh, of the starting line and also being uh, not deviating from it in terms of orientation. So the termination, we have when the robot falls or when uh, the episode ends. And I'm using, again, 
uh, of policy algorithm uh, with a general state dependent exploration to use it directly on the real robot. And it takes, unfortunately, some hours to uh, make it work. So uh, after three hours, it starts to go forward. Four hours, it starts to, to work. And five, six hours, it starts to, to really work and be more efficient. Um, it's still quite a lot. And that's why, in fact, I'm working on making things faster by using more knowledge about the robot. And this learning for, from scratch is mostly meant as a baseline for me. And the video I want to show you is the training process of it from uh, from zero hour of training, where it's completely trying random things to uh, to proper working. So yeah, at the very beginning, it's it's very random. You need to have a robust robot, and this is a very nice thing about this platform is it's it's very robust and reliable so you can command a lot of things on it. So after two hours of training, it starts going a bit forward. It's not very elegant. So you need still more training. And then five hours of training, it already starts looking more like walking. Still not perfect, but uh, much better than before. And if you continue training, uh, you will end up with a good walking gait. Okay, so that was it for this first part. Um, so just as a reminder, simulation is probably not all you need. You can also learn directly on a robot. Don't forget to uh, make sure that you have a smooth control. And by smooth, I mean both in terms of exploration and at the end by using the continuity cost. And if you also want to learn faster from images, you should think about decoupling a feature extraction from policy learning. And uh, if you want to make things even more simple, efficient, uh, well, as what was said yesterday in the, um, you can use more knowledge about the robot. And in, in fact, that's what my PhD is about. You bringing knowledge um, to reinforcement learning to make training on real robot faster and possible. So nice time for questions. Oh, we have a bunch of questions. So. If we apply RLGSD on a real setup, how can we tune hyperparameters beforehand without any knowledge about the dynamical system? But this is a good question. How, how do we know which hyperparameter to use? Um, so the thing I did is I tuned those hyperparameters uh, in simulation. on, um, And then I, I found that, especially for SAC and TQC, those algorithms work on a wide range of tasks at least continuous tasks that look more or less the same. Um, and then I didn't have to do uh, much. In fact, I did not do any tuning and those hyperparameters were quite robust uh, to the new task. But that, that's a good question. Uh, the good thing is more recent algorithms are usually more robust to hyperparameter change. Um, even though you will not have the best hyperparameter, it would still uh, work, especially with ACC and TQC. Oh, Cedric, uh, how does GSD compare to something like parameter perturbation, adding noise on the weight for one episode, which also lead to temporary stricter noise? Um, I'm thinking of noising net from DeepMind or the parameter noise of Plapper. So this is a very good question. Um, in fact, in the linear case, uh, those two are equivalent. So parameter uh, perturbation and, and GSD are equivalent. Um, but in, in a more complicated setting, then they, they start to differ. Um, and the main difference, I would say, for instance, with the parameter noise of Plapper, in that case, they still define uh, distance in the action space, and you still need to tune uh, tune that distance, and it's not always trivial. And I think it's quite close to noise in it, but I, I need to check. Um, 
those I think are quite related. And in fact, um, I'm doing uh, additional experiment, but most of the work is is done by just repeating the noise uh, during end steps. The, I think maybe the main difference is the formulation, which is very simple to to include to uh, ex existing algorithms. It's completely compatible with all um, policy gradient method. Could you please elaborate on how the encoder decoder neural network are trained in your particular case? It's just back propagation like algo. Uh, yes, so here I'm using a neural network to um, encode the image. And so, um, so, so it's it, yeah, it's just back propagation. Uh, it's it's a very so autoencoder are, are here since a long time, and they are used in many many places. And and yeah, it's just back propagation. Um, with history, do you mean the previous action or? previous states frame stacking. So I mean both. I mean um, giving the previous action for for continuity and also giving the previous state so and stacking those two. When do you need to use LSTM for learning time dependencies? Um, so I don't have much experience with LSTM, but the little experience that I have with LSTM is that usually just using frame stacking is already quite competitive and much simpler and faster to train. Uh, so until now, I've never really used LSTM. So I can't completely uh, answer that. Is a racing car in the racing car problem? How can you measure the smoothness and the total reward is normalized? So the because you normalize each component of your reward, uh, that's how you normalize the total reward. And how can you measure the smoothness? Well, you can um, easily measure each action which was taken at every time step. And this, then you can uh, either do um, a Fourier transform of it and take a look at the spectrum of it, or you can even easier just compute the, the, the continuity cost on, on those actions. And the last thing to measure the smoothness will be more qualitative measure where you can directly take a look um, at your robot. How do you collect training samples for the autoencoder? Do you collect them before or at the same time of the car policy training? So it's a very good question. So the good news with autoencoder is you can use anything to, to collect data. And usually I just drive myself uh, randomly. You don't need to be a good driver for collecting data. You mostly need to collect data that cover um, most of the space uh, that you, you want to encode. And for that, you can use anything. And in fact, you could also uh, later reuse the, the policy to collect more data. I'm not doing that because I don't need it, but in case you need it, you can, you can still do it. Um, could you explain in more detail the wrapper you mentioned as a fix for breaking M MDP in donkey car or to, due to uh, Wi-Fi latency? So for communication delay, um, usually it's, it's what I talked just before. It's the history wrapper. So, uh, stacking two state plus giving the previous, um, action as input, but you can stack more than one state depending on your delay. It, it will make your state space bigger. Uh, but usually with neural networks now it's fine unless you have thousands of dimensions. Okay. Okay, so I think we are done with the questions. I will give some seconds more, otherwise, I think we're done. Um, so I think let's do a small break, like five minute break, so everyone can take a coffee. Um, and the next part will be um, ends on session with Stable Bezant 3. I give you the link here uh, for the notebook, but the, please uh, wait for me uh, because there will be first a presentation and then we will code it long um, for that. And let's let's put the timer.
Okay. <laughs> I don't know for the organizer, but I think we are good in terms of time schedule. Yeah, it's perfect.
All right, I think we can continue now. What do you think? Yeah, of course. Okay, let me just. So the first part was more about um, how to apply RL on a custom task and showing you some examples um, on how to, to do it uh, on real robot. And now this, this second part is uh, more about directly uh, trying some algorithm in practice, at least on simulated environments. And for that, we will be um, using stable baseline 3. Um, and that would be uh, a session using Colad notebooks. But first, I would like to give you some overview of what is Stable Bayesian 3 and what can it do for you. Um, and the end of the session will be a, a mix of coding along and then exercise where you will have some time to solve them. Uh, so first thing first, I would like to give you a small history about Stable Bayesian. So, um, it's, it was 2018, and at that time, there was a library named OpenAI Baselines, which were reinforcement learning implementation by OpenAI. And those implementations were working quite well in terms of performance, but they were um, infamously known to be quite hard to use and hard to read. And um, at that time, I was at Insta, and I was working on state representation learning. Um, and we wanted to evaluate the different methods using reinforcement learning. We tested different code bases and the OpenAI baseline was the one working best. The problem was that they kept pushing things on their master branch, which was breaking our code and which was reintroduce reintroducing bugs that were fixed before. And at some point we decided to fork it, uh, because we couldn't rely on something that was uh, breaking our code uh, that much, and we we did quite a lot of changing on it. And among those changes, as I will show you here, there was a lot of fixes, and we also documented all method. And um, Ashley had the nice ID, so my student Ashley had the nice ID to create a nice interface, a common interface for every algorithm. And this is heavily inspired by Psychic Learn. So that's what you can see on the left which is a result, what you can do with stable baselines. You just import the algorithm, uh, define what type of uh, policy, is it a CNN or is it a fully connected policy architecture that you want to use? Then uh, the problem that you want to work on here, the cardboard environment, and you just call the learn method of it for some training time step. And finally, you can save, load, or query your agent. And so this, this project uh, was uh, quite nice to maintain, and we learned a lot during uh, the two years. Um, in fact, I'm not alone. We are five uh, maintaining the library. So Ashley, Max, Adam, and Hans. Over those two years, it, it was quite a rewarding experience, uh, and we learned a lot, especially with all our users. We had more than 60 contributors and more than 1,000 issues and pull requests combined. So it was quite active. And at the end, uh, we also had more than 300 uh, papers using uh, our library. So we learned a lot. The problem was this library we were still relying on TensorFlow 1. And at its core, it was still uh, legacy code from OpenAI. So it was getting hard to maintain, hard to uh, add new features. And because TensorFlow 1 was getting uh, deprecated, we needed to, uh, to move anyway. So after asking our users and asking all the maintainers, we decided to go for a almost complete rewrite using PyTorch. And that's how Stable Bayesian 3 started. So what is Stable Bayesian 3? Stable Bayesian 3 is just um, the next major version of stable design, but with much cleaner code base. And obviously, um, we are trying to keep the same API, API uh, so that users are not lost. We also did uh, 
it took quite a while, but we also checked the performance, uh, both in terms of speed and in terms of uh, of uh, reaching maximal uh, rewards. You comparing to original implementations, um, and we were in beta in for for almost one year before saying, okay, we are now sure that uh, there can be only minor uh, bugs in the algorithms, and. Using a cleaner code base also allowed us to type everything um, and to have a much better code coverage. So code coverage is how much uh, percentage, the percentage of line of code covered by unit test. And we have a quite uh, high coverage, which is uh, more than 95% in fact now. And the last thing is this library was um, quite welcomed by the community. And this is very important, in fact, for a library to have a community, because if your library is not used, um, well, then if there's a bug, probably uh, it, it won't be found. And also having active community allow us to have new ideas, to have new ideas to think, to implement, to find, uh, to improve the documentation. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, nice. And to show you a bit, uh, um, how big is a community? So we have more than uh, 3,000 stars for Stable Design 2 repo. And on the new Stable Designs, we are almost uh, 20,000 downloads per week of, of the package. And it's already used by almost uh, 150 repos on GitHub with more than 40 contributors. So it's, it's a quite a nice community. And um, being actively used is also one of the main difference uh, between all the libraries, I would say. So what makes it different from all the library? Um, the main thing of stable based designs is we want to provide reliable implementation of RL algorithms. And we want um, also to be uh, user friendly so that it, RL can be applied to other problem or those implementation can be easily used as a baseline uh, to compare to other things. And to keep our core uh, simple to maintain uh, and small, we focus on model-free single agent reinforcement learning and rely on other repo functions for imitation learning or offline reinforcement learning. Uh, those are external repository. And we also favor readability over uh, and simplicity over modularity compared to many other libraries, which means that we do a bit more code duplication, uh, but then you don't have to search through the whole code base to understand uh, which function is called. And in fact, the library is too easy to use that we had to put a warning on our readme to ensure that people using it actually know um, a bit about reinforcement learning. Um, because you should not expect also magic, even though it's easy to use, you should always know about what you are doing and what are the algorithm that you are using. So what are the features of that library? So we have uh, many state of the art algorithm, both on policy and off policy. We provide a clean and simple interface to use. And also one of the big I would say selling point is we have a fully, uh, it's fully documented and we always try to improve documentation when possible. We provide also um, the users with uh, many uh, useful things like uh, tensorball logging or um, callback to, uh, um, to change uh, training without modifying the code uh, of, of the algorithm. And when you know more about Stable Business Read, then you can directly um, use our training framework, which is the RLZU. I will talk a bit more about that in the next slide. And because we keep our core simple and small, and RL is still fast paced, and, and there's a lot of new algorithm coming every uh, month, um, we have a contrib repo where we have more experimental features like neural algorithms um, or additional wrapper. Just to give you an example, uh, there's currently a pull request about invalid action masking for PPO. And this country repo allow us to, uh, to move faster while maintaining our core simple. And we still have uh, quite, I would say, high standard to have anything merged into our country. So we still ensure 
uh, the quality of each implementation. Next thing I would like to show you is just a simple getting starting, showing you what's possible with the library. But in fact, we're going to see that again in the collab notebook. So here, um, I will just show you how to um, define an agent, train it, save it, load it, and then use it in practice to, to predict actions. All you need to do, well, is uh, create your environment. Here, I'm just using a predefined uh, gym environment, so I'm using gym.make. Um, then uh, we have, we define uh, which algorithm we want to use on the environment. We train the model using .learn um, for a budget of 20,000 time steps. Then we save it. Later, we can delete the model and then just reload it. And to query it, we need some observation of uh, from coming from the environment. Uh, this is what this env.reset does. It starts a new episode. And we directly can query uh, the agent uh, for the observation. Here, you have two things to notice. One thing is uh, predicting an action given an observation. You have a parameter which is deterministic, which means do you want to sample an action from the stochastic policy or do you want to use uh, the deterministic output of it? And it returns the tuple because for recurrent policy, which in fact currently are not implemented, we need to also uh, store the hidden state and give the hidden state to the user. And that's why it returns the tuple of action and hidden state. But currently we are not uh, using it, but it's for um, future version. Um, I would like to give you just a quick, more uh, a quick view of the internal of what's happening when you're calling uh, model.learn. So model.learn is just um, alternating between two phases. The first phase is collecting experience with the current policy. So exploring in the environment and filling the buffer. And then every end step or every end episode you want to update your policy and internally it calls model.learn and it, this will do the gradient steps to optimize the actor, the critic networks and update the target networks if needed. And then you just repeat, you go back to the first step and you collect experience with the updated policy. And you do that until you have exhausted your budget. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that you can have multiple environments in parallel to collect uh, data, and that's what we call vectorized environment. Um, and for that, when you collect n step, it's n step times the number of environments that you are using in parallel. Um, so one of the last thing I would like to talk about before we go to the collab notebook is uh, the reinforcement learning zoo. So the reinforcement learning zoo is a training framework for for stable baselines. Um, it's, it's mostly meant for managing experiments, uh, and also tuning upper parameters and showing you the best practices, but you should use it only when you know more about stable baselines, because it does a lot of things for you. And, and you should a bit know about the internals before using it as a black box. So it includes many things. So it includes training, loading, plotting scripts, even hyper parameter optimization. We also provide you with uh, more than 100 trained model with the associated tuned hyperparameters. Uh, we also um, have in that repo all the logs from uh, those trained models, so you can compare uh, the different, uh, you can at least have an idea of, of the learning graph and, and the final performance of it. And to give you a quick example of what you can do with the RLZU, um, here are two lines, so two comments that you can see. One, the first one is training an A2C agent on the Atari breakout game and evaluating it on a separate environment every 10,000 steps and then saving a checkpoint every uh, 50,000 steps. And the next comment is just to learn uh, to plot the learning curve from the previous experiment. So it RLZU does a lot of things for you and it also previous um, uh, prevent a lot of problem from happening. Um, and it's meant to help you, uh, to help reproducibility because we save all, par all parameters and, um, you can easily continue training. You can easily reproduce an experiment if needed. 
and obviously um, I'm using it on to on the three examples that you have seen so far so the elastic neck uh, the racing car and the quadruped bird. I'm using both Stable Design 3 as a core Stable Design contrib for having the newest algorithm and additional wrappers and the Arezu for experiment management. And uh, this combination is usually quite uh, nice to have if you want to do a RL experiment. Uh, so before we go to the Collab Notebook, let's do a quick recap. Uh, of what is Stable Business 3. So we provide you with reliable RL implementation. It's meant to be mostly user-friendly. And when you know more about it, I can only encourage you to use the training framework uh, which that come with it, which is the RL Zoo. So now, before we go to the next session, I've got some time for question. Any reason for favoring PyTorch over TensorFlow? Um, that's a good question. So we have a complete thread about it. In fact, I gave TensorFlow to a try. And uh, the main reason was, uh, well, it's twofold. One, it's it was a maintainer choice. So we are more um, keen to use PyTorch. Um, and the other reason was also our users. When we surveyed our users, the result was uh, there was a major um, they were mainly asking for PyTorch instead of TensorFlow 2, for instance. Which library would you recommend for multi-agent RL? Uh, Cyberbin 3 doesn't seem to cover this area. Um, I haven't tried any, but I've, I think there's something called Petting Zoo that you can check out, but I, uh, I, don't, I don't know, so I cannot recommend any. Uh, you may also take a look at RL Lib, which have some uh, multi-agent training in it. And Ray RLlib is meant more for um, massive parallelization and, and scaling training. Uh, similar question in recommendation for Moldavia's R library. So, so far, I haven't seen any. Uh, I think there was a very recent one uh, that was uh, public, put public on GitHub, which was, the name is Bellman, but I never tried it, so I cannot recommend any. Does SB3 framework allow for use cases with implicit reward in addition to the basic explicit reward? If so, how to implement such implicit reward? Um, ah, you mean, yeah, in interesting reward. So that, that's a good question. And in fact, we are mostly going to see how to do that. Um, it's what you need to use is called a gym wrapper and we will cover that in, in, the, not, in the notebook uh, in the session. Is it easy to implement the cost of env is table based on three? Uh, yes, if you're, you just need to follow the gym interface. We heavily rely on the gym interface. And in fact, again, I'm going to talk about the gym interface uh, very soon. How flexible is SB3? Can we filter action space, illegal moves? Uh, so for that, uh, you need a special implementation and that's what we are currently reviewing in our contrib repo. Um, where can we form more information about racing car implementation, both for training and real implementation? Um, so for that, you can look for my GitHub or for my website, and it's called Learning in Minutes. So it's an old, two years old implementation, but the core is here. I plan, in fact, to um, to publish my more recent code soon, but I, I need to clean it up and to prepare a more blog post about it. But if you search for Jim Donkey Car, uh, you, you will also already find a lot of information. And there's a Discord uh, if you want for that community. Are prioritized dip distributed and other improvement like uh, in like that coded in Stable Business Three, or would it be easy to implement? Um, so prioritized uh, replay is on the roadmap. It's not implemented, and in fact, uh, on some algorithm you don't need it. You can use something else. Um, distributed? No, we don't do that. Uh, we mostly have parallelization, simple parallelization using uh, multiple workers, but it's not using the full power of every core. Uh, that's what Stable Baseline 2 was using uh, with MPI, for instance. 
if the end cannot be simulated as a gym spec, can it be used in SB3? Uh, usually there's always a way to um, at least make a bridge between your environment and the gym interface. And uh, because we want to test everything and uh, we cannot, we only rely on gym interface. So if it doesn't follow the gym interface, we don't, uh, we don't support that. Okay, many question again. As for multi-agent RL, uh, you said RLib is for massive parallelization, but what is massive multi-agent compared to reasonable multi-agent? No, I, I mainly meant um, it's mostly meant for distributed distributed uh, training when you have multiple nodes and you can send uh, different worker on each node. And I'm not a big uh, I don't know much about multi-agent, so I cannot really answer that question. Unfortunately, does table baseline include framework to manage teacher algorithm like her, for example? Yeah, we have Insight Experience AAA is now included uh, in it. In fact, I'm working on the refactored version of it, uh, but it's it's included if you want to use it. Is the library support some bandy algorithm? No, we, we don't, um, because our, our focus is mostly, I would say, on deep reinforcement learning, so not bandits. Does the library support multi-threading? Uh, because the library is written in Python, multi-threading is <laughs> um, not a good thing, but you can it supports multi-processing. And you can also, what you can do is um, implement your environment uh, such as it's multi-threaded, and then you can pass that to stable baselines. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so um, next step for you uh, is to go to um, to that uh, URL and you need to open it in Colab and, and connect to it um, uh, and also wait, I will come soon. And there's, there's a link directly, so if you click on the link, uh, I mean, I would put it probably in the chat also. You need to go to content and then you can directly open in Colab Notebook. And I'm doing a short break, so I'll be back in uh, three minutes. Okay. Okay, I've written the link in the chat. Do we need the GPU accelerator? Uh, no, no, you can just use a CPU on that. And for a more technical question, okay. uh, then I think it would be nice to go to matrix. Um,
Okay, so let, let's do a quick poll to see um, if everyone uh, can connect. So A is you could uh, connect uh, and B is you still, you still have trouble. Okay, so if you have more trouble, I would recommend you to go to the matrix uh, chat and ask the teaching assistants. Okay. I think we have a huge majority of people ready, so we can uh, just continue. Um, so the, the way this session will work is there will be uh, alternation between um, writing along. So I, I will show you how to do uh, something with Stable Business 3, and I'm expecting you to, for, to write it also at the same time, more or less. Um, and then there will be some exercises. And no worry, the exercises are timed. And if you don't uh, cannot finish them, don't worry, because I will provide a solution notebook with everything uh, in it uh, at the end. Um, and yeah, and if you have any trouble, then um, please use the, the matrix uh, forum for that. Uh, the other thing that I would like to tell you is uh, I would highly recommend you also to open a tab with the documentation of Stable Baseline 3 because um, you you will probably need it to 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 find how to uh, how to do some exercise. The answer will be probably also in the documentation. Um, so. In, in this notebook, we will see different things that will um, that are useful when doing RL experimentation. I will first start with uh, presenting a bit more the gym interface because uh, we highly rely on it. Um, and then I will show you how to use gym wrappers, which are useful for many things and changing the observation space or doing uh, some pre-processing, for instance, adding an interesting reward. And then we will see how to use callback to modify training for saving checkpoints. Uh, and we will finish with a small challenge uh, with hyperparameter tuning. Um, so let's start. So the first thing you need to do, so to run cells, you can either click on run or you can use mash enter and it will uh, run the cell. First thing we need to do is install stable Bayesian 3. So you can either just copy paste uh, the comment, uh, be careful. You should always, uh, use exclamation mark if you want to run a comment in collab notebook, otherwise it will be run as a Python code. So you just install it as a package. The extra package is for everything related to, um, Atari game or more, uh, processing image processing. You don't need it, but it's recommended. And the next things we can do is install the stable Bayesian 3 uh, package, uh, the contrib package. Um, so here it's just again pip install and stable Bayesian 3 contrib. And in fact, when you install stable Bayesian 3 contrib, which allow you to have access to more algorithm, more write, uh, more features, it will also install stable Bayesian 3 uh, by default because it's dependent on it. Okay, and I think we're good to go. Um, so the first thing I would like to present you is uh, the gym interface, uh, because it's it's very important to understand the concept and understand how it works. Because we just uh, we mostly rely on that. So OpenAI gym is in fact two things. It's both an interface to follow to uh, for creating custom environment, and it's also um, uh, providing uh, already defined environment in it. And it's mainly composed of two methods. So a reset method, which is uh, should be called at every beginning of an episode, it will just return an observation. 
and then it has a step uh, method which take an action as input and return um, the next observation, the reward, and if the episode was terminal, and at the end it also returns some additional information. And under the, under the hood, you mainly to have to define two uh, two things: the observation space, um, which can be so of different sort, discrete, continuous. Uh, this is what you give to your agent as input, and the action space, which is uh, what um, how the agent can act on the environment. And to give you just a quick example, if we use a box environment, which is just a continuous uh, space. Uh, this is how we define um, an image. So an image is just uh, values between 0 and 255. And uh, the shape is the shape of the, the image. And the type is unsigned int uh, of 8 bits. The same way, if you have a discrete space, you can specify how many discrete um, action or discrete features you have. And we have some documentation, again, in our code about that. Um, so this is how a uh, custom gym environment look like. So we have to define our observation space, our action space, um, which here are just continuous uh, spaces. The first is with 14 dimension. The second one is with uh, six dimension. And here the space is normalized for the action space. For the observation space, uh, here it doesn't really matter. So we set the limits uh, to minus infinity and infinity. And the first thing we need to define is a reset method, which will output a gym observation. Uh, so the gym observation can be uh, a tuple, a dictionary, or NumPy array. But in practice, it's most of the time, it's NumPy array or integer if it's discrete space. And there's a useful method on spaces, on gym spaces, which is a sample method, uh, which will allow you to sample value from, uh, from gym spaces. And then the next thing you need to define for a custom environment uh, is a step method, which take as input the action, so which can be either discrete, so if it's an int, or a continuous, which is uh, the array here. And it returns a tuple, so the gym, it returns the new observation. Here we just sample from the observation space. The reward, which is a float number, um, if it's uh, if the episode is uh, it's last time of last time step of an episode, and some additional information. So additional information are anything that can could be useful for debugging or for logging, and it's just the di dictionaries of values. And then we can simply instantiate it and check it using the AMP checker from stable baselines. So the AMP checker is uh, located there, and if we run that cell, then it should just work because the environment should uh, pass the different tests we have in the AMP checker. So that's done. So to use uh, stable Bayesian 3, uh, where we will do some uh, classic import, I would say, because we uh, are going to use Jim and NumPy. And then we can directly import from stable Bayesian 3 the different algorithm we would like to use. Um, here, we're going just to import most of them. And the same goes for uh, stable Bayesian 3 contrib, which has additional algorithm like uh, quantile regression DQN or the distributional version of a soft actor critic. Uh, next things we need to choose is what type of policy we want. Do we want a fully connected policy or do we want a convolutional neural network policy. Here we are staying same, simple, so we are going to use MLP policy. Here I gave you um, the complete pass to it, but in practice we can just pass a string to um, to, uh, to the agent. And this is, a, I would say, recommended version because it will find uh, the correct policy for the correct algorithm automatically. And here the environment we are using, and you probably already know it, is the Cardpool environment. And so you just, you come on the poll, you can go left and right. So it's discrete action space. Uh, you have some information about the position of the cart and the, pos and the, or uh, and the orientation of the poll. And the goal is to keep uh, the, the poll straight as long as uh, possible. And so you get a plus one reward for every time step where uh, it doesn't fail. 
so the first thing uh, we need to do is uh, create the gym environment. And here we are going to use the version one of Cardpole uh, because it, it's harder to, uh, to solve. It has a maximum uh, limit. Uh, the timeout limit is 500 time step. So all we need to do to define the environment is called gym.make and then uh, the ID of the environment. So here the name is Cardpole version one. If you use a custom environment, you can also register it. So you can call gym.make to, to create it, but you can also directly uh, instantiate it. The next thing you need to do is instantiate um, RL algorithm. Here we are going to use PPO with, uh, as I say, MLP policy. Uh, we passed as a second argument the environment we want to use. And uh, because we want some information in the terminal, I'm going to set variables to one. And then we can execute it. Next things we can directly uh, check is the observation space and action space of Cardpole. So the observation space um, is continuous values, four values uh, between minus infinity and infinity, which correspond to the card position and the pole orientation and velocity. And then uh, we have the action space is a discrete action space, so left and right, and we have two actions. So to retrieve the first observation, you just need to reset the environment. So calling amp.reset. And then you can directly predict the action uh, using the model, that, the RL model that you define. Uh, again, here it's a tuple because we have the action and then a hidden state we are not using. And we could just call model.predict on the observation. The, the argument you need to be aware of is the deterministic argument. And if you want to sample, you can set it to false. If you want a deterministic action, you can set it to true. And then using the environment action space, we can check if our action is valid, which, which means it does the, uh, is the action content in the action space. And we can just take a look at it. And because it's an int, so zero is left, one is right, um, it looks like everything is fine. And the next things we need to do is then step in the environment. To step in the environment, we're just going to call the dot step method. And it will return, so a tuple, it will return the new observation, the reward, if the episode is over, and some additional information. And for that, we just call amp.step giving uh, the action from the agent. And then we can check that the observation space is as the shape uh, that we expect. The reward is a float. It's one for every time step and the episode is not over. There's one important thing you need to know is that when the episode is over, you need to manually uh, reset the environment. So if the episode is over, um, you need to manually reset the environment. When you use multiple environment with stable Bayesian 3, this is done automatically. But if you use only one environment and it's not vectorized, then uh, this, this won't work. So the first exercise um, I would like you to do to, for you to get familiar uh, with the gym interface and with stable Bayesian 3, and also, this is a very important exercise as um, you will uh, need to write the evaluate uh, method. So the evaluate method is something we use very often to evaluate our agent. And the goal is um, here, you will have a model as input, the environment where, on which you want to evaluate, the number of episodes you want to evaluate your agent on, and whether you want to use the deterministic or stochastic um, actions. And as output, it will return the mean reward for those evaluation episodes. So what you need to do is run um, n-eval episodes in the gym environment using the model past year, and then keep track of every reward that was uh, of the total reward per episode, and then do uh, an average of it, and then return it. You can also uh, print it uh, if you want. 
And if you want to check, um, you have uh, check your method, there's a small code here. If you have question, uh, you can ask them in the matrix chat, or you can also, I would highly recommend you to take a look at the documentation. And for this first exercise, I will give you 10 minutes. And after those 10 minutes, we will correct it together. Um, so I wanted to stream some music, but unfortunately it's saturated. So it will be uh, just uh, nothing for those 10 minutes. <laughs> Let's just reset it and start it now. So the question is, can we get corrected notebook at the end? Yes, I will. I will give it. Uh, it's it's already ready. It's just not published. And so now we've also had a question on matrix about stable design. Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, that in Ray Airlib, there is something called external end where you can build a client that will interact with the physical world and you can send it back to the server to do the training. Mm -hmm. Does step three support that feature? Uh, yeah, I'm reading the question. So uh, you, usually what you do when you want to interact with the real world is you use a middleware like ROS um, where it would be more or less the same thing or for the real car, I'm just using sockets to communicate with it. And then I still, um, I still uh, allow to have, uh, it's, it's still encapsulated at the end in the gym environment, but behind the scene, I can interact with a robot using uh, ROS or sockets. So I don't think we support that directly, but if you encapsulate it in, in gym environment, it's possible. So the question is, what would be the mean result? Um, so the mean result is, um, will be of an untrained agent on, uh, on card pool. So around 10 is, is normal. And in fact, I will try to, to seed, um, to seed the environment and seed everything and use deterministic evaluation. So you can compare to it. So there was a problem with dependencies to fix. Um, that probably means you are not using Colab Notebook. And I would only highly recommend you to use Colab Notebook because this would 
prevent you from any dependency issue. Because you can obviously use it then later at home, but during this session, we don't have much time. So please use the Collab Notebook if possible. Is there a code example recommendation of the combination of ROS and SB3 for RL, RL on GitHub? Um, not really. I got some old code. If you look for us, um, set representation learning toolbox, I've got some code here. Um, you can take a look at it. But it was using ROS1, so I needed to do a bridge between Python 2 and 3. Evaluate function should be renamed into evaluate policy. Um, no, because evaluate policy will be the one from stable base and three, and we won't, don't want to have conflict of name. So there's a question about default hyperparameters saying uh, SB3 default, I could starting hyperparameters value, but that doesn't mean if I run DQN on Lunar Nunder on Carpool, I will arrive to a good policy that beats the game without changing the default hyperparameters. Could you clarify about what you meant by good default hyperparameter settings? Um, so it would probably solve it, but you would need uh, quite a uh, big budget uh, probably to solve it compared to what is really needed if you need it if you need uh, tuned hyperparameters and in fact for those environments you can find tuned hyperparameters in the RL zoo and what I meant by good default is that they usually work quite well on many problems even though they are, they are not the best hyperparameters that you can get um, it means that it's a good starting point Is it possible in SB3 to use the same environment C to obtain the same results in the case of a deterministic policy? Uh, yes, it's possible. In, in fact, we have some tests in Stable Baseline 3 to test uh, the de determinism and check that we can completely reproduce experiments, at least on CPU.
there's a question about wrappers and that's a good thing because we are going to see how to code your own wrappers in the next uh, exercise in fact So time time's up. Um, so for those of you, I will I will do a quick um, poll of who was able to finish on time and uh, who was not. And in case you didn't have the time to finish uh, the exercise, it's not a problem. Uh, we don't have much time, so that's why I put it some timer. And I will obviously provide a solution notebook at the very end if you want to compare and finish the exercise taking more time. And this is mostly also to challenge you a bit to uh, to code it uh, fast. Uh, so I, I will do a poll and just answer A if you manage to finish it in time and B if not. Okay, it starts to stabilize. Two thirds managed, one said did not. Um, so for those who did not, it's not a problem. It's, um, yeah, it's meant to be a challenge and you will have the, the solution notebook afterward. So, um, okay. So now let's see uh, how to do that exercise. So the first thing uh, we need to do is um, is have a counter of the number of episodes that we want to uh, on which we want to evaluate, and we're going to call that n episodes. Uh, then we need also something to keep track of the current episode reward. We can name that episode uh, reward, and we set it to zero at the beginning. Then we need something to um, to keep track of each episode uh, total rewards and we it, it will be a list and once we have done that uh, we can simply uh, uh, reset the environment and start uh, a new episode then what what we're going to do is we're going to loop uh, while the number of episodes is uh, below uh, what we want on how many episodes we want to evaluate and um, during uh, those loops then we need to query our uh, model so we're just going to call predict on the current observation predict and uh, here that's where we pass the deterministic parameter from the function once we have the action, uh, we can simply step in the, into the environment, get the new observation, the new reward, if the episode is over, and some informations using the f.step on the action. Um, here we need to update our uh, current uh, episode reward. Just increment it by the current reward. Um, and then we need a special treatment if it's the end of an episode. If it's an end of an episode, we need to update our list of total reward per episode. Then we need to reset our uh, episode uh, episodic reward. And last but not least, you need to also reset the environment. Here it would be an uh, infinite loop, so I also need to increment uh, the number of episodes that uh, have been done. Okay, and once we have done that, uh, we mostly need to compute the mean. So mean episode reward is just taking a numpy a mean of 
the list. Episode rewards. And we can print it also. So here I'm using f strings for uh, more easier formatting. So the min reward is just uh, min episode reward. And we're going to format it a bit more nicely uh, using only two, uh, two number after the dot. And we can also uh, write in how many episodes were used for evaluation. Okay. Um, to make things more reproducible, I will uh, try to seed everything. Uh, so I will say uh, model is PPO of MLP policy. Uh, I need to define also the environment, which is gym.make card pole version one. I pass the environment. I set the seed fonts to one. I still set it to verbos. Um, okay. And that's what we do. And then you pass, uh, you can pass directly your model, the environment, uh, and we will set it to deterministic. And this should uh, work. So there's some questions. Uh, we'll answer them in, I think, in the next exercise for the two ones. Is an episode equivalent to one step? Uh, shouldn't we have a while loop for termination condition? Another one if the number of episodes. Um, so this thing here, it will uh, work because that's that's where we handle here the the new episodes. So you don't need to have to a while loop uh, for that. Uh, okay, and obviously because this uh, method is um, very useful and you need to use it very often, it's obviously included in Stable Basin 3. And in fact, we use a wrapper around it uh, because usually if you do modify the reward, we still want to have access to the original reward. And that's what the monitor file is doing. Um, and here we can just reuse what we have done here to sit everything and we can try to compare uh, the two implementation. And we see that the min reward is the same. Oh, I forgot to wrap it into a monitor, but that's not a big problem here because we are not modifying uh, the reward. And you can see here that the min reward is the same, uh, which probably means that the implementation was right. So next things uh, we need to do, and I will just, for the sake of avoiding warnings, I will just wrap it into a monitor file. So the next things we need to do um, is just train the agent. And for that, we just call learn uh, on the model, and then we will evaluate it. So here, uh, mean reward of nine is pretty random. It means that it's mo mostly fonts going left or mostly going right. And after 10 stamp step, it's out of the frame. And so it, it fails. And we will see that after 10,000 time step, it will already have uh, learned something much useful. And during training, so you will have many information. So if you use a monitor wrapper, you will have information about the mean episodic reward, the mean length, uh, of an episode and for the last 100 episodes you will have also information about the current training the loss function how many updates you have done so far how many frames per second uh, are done in your environment and uh, the time since you started training so once we have trained our agent we can evaluate it and if everything went well we should have a big improvement in um, in the min episodic reward. And already the thing that it's taking much longer to evaluate means that every episode uh, takes longer, which is a good thing. 
So here it's almost um, optimal. It's almost so the optimal value is five uh, Android, and it it has learned already to balance the pool quite well. Um, so let's let's see how it looks like. Um, I will not go into details into the next sets because it's mostly for um, viewing, uh, displaying a video in Colab. So it's not really interesting, recording and viewing a video in Colab. So uh, I will just record the video using the train model on Cardpole, and I will show uh, the video of it in the environment. And so this is what's happening. So it's it's not uh, perfect because it still drifts a bit, but it's already much better than uh, just being random. And you can see it has already started to learn to balance the pole, even though it's yeah it still drifts at the end. So the next exercise um, I would like you to do to get uh, used um, with a stable Bayesian three API is uh, saving, loading the model and checking that, in fact, after loading that the model is still is correct and correspond to what you expect. Um, so to do that, you will first need to sample observation, uh, which you will use before and after uh, loading to check that the action predicted are the same. And for that, you will need to use the sample method on the observation space of Jim. Then you need to predict actions on those observations and store those actions. Be sure to use deterministic actions, otherwise you may have different output. Then you need to save the model. Here we're going to delete the model just to show that we are really loading the model and not just reusing the variable. And if you properly save the model, you will have a zip file uh, that, that, that you can see. And then you need to load the model and predict using the loaded model um, actions on the observation that you sampled before. And here there's a small test to check that um, what you did was right. It checks that the actions before loading are the same as the action after loading. And I would, most of the answer here, in fact, are in uh, the documentation. So if you block, probably just take a quick look at the documentation. And for that, uh, you will have a uh, five minute starting uh, now. So there was one question not re just related to Cyberbizon, which was, is multiprocessing going to be implemented for TD3 in SB3? So the question is for off policy algorithm. Currently, we only support to use one environment, but yes, it's on our roadmap to support multiple environment for all off policy algorithms. And there's a question: Is the continuity condition imposed only on position? Um, probably relate to the example I've shown in the very first part. Uh, but continuity condition can be applied to anything. It's just applied to your actions.
So the question is offline batch RL um, baseline including stable baseline three. So as we are focusing on model three RL, we don't um, we are not doing any offline RL. But you can take a look at the library name uh, D three RL Pi, which includes um, which has also a nice interface, and we have um, something to convert replay buffer from stable baseline three to those algorithms. Okay, time's up. Um, as usual, I want to do a quick poll on uh, who managed to do it on time and who couldn't. So the next time I'm doing that tutorial, I can also adjust uh, the timing. Let's do a quick poll. So again, A is you manage and B, uh, it was uh, too fast. Okay, it's, it was a bit more tricky apparently to get it to work, probably because of some an intuitive interface in the predict action. Uh, we will see. Okay, let's stop the polling. Okay, so I will probably need to... Uh, Give more time next time. Um, so let's see how it takes, uh, what it takes to um, to actually uh, save and load a reinforcement learning model with stable Bayesian three, and also check that actually everything is fine. So um, the first thing we need to do is sample some observation uh, that we will use as a test. So for that, we just uh, create an NumPy array which will contain uh, just several observations. So for that, we can just directly call um, amp.observationspace.sample. And here we're just going to sample some, so let's say 10 observation. Then um, we need to predict action before saving. So action before saving uh, would just be here it's a tuple, be aware. It's a bit an intuitive, but it, in fact, it's very important for us when we're really using a uh, recurrent network. Um, it's just calling model.predict on the observation. And here, because we want to check everything, uh, that everything is the same, we're going to use a deterministic policy on it. You can run the cell. And then to save the model, you just call model.save. Um, and here we're going to name in PPO card pool. You don't need to specify dot zip. Uh, it will do it automatically for you. So we save the model. We can then delete the model. Now, if we try to uh, use the model, it's not here anymore. We need to load it. This will result in an error. Yes, perfectly. And we see that um, our model is properly saved in the zip file. So this zip file contains all the relevant information to uh, load the model and continue training. For off policy algorithm, you will need to save the replay buffer uh, separately. To load the model here, the trick may be something which uh, is not completely intuitive is you need to call the base class, uh, the load method on the base class, uh, and then pass the path to the file. Again, you don't need to specify dot zip, it will uh, find it for you automatically. And to predict the action after loading, you can mostly copy paste what we have done for saving. Uh, and we just name those after loading. We make sure deterministic is set to true. Uh, we predict, and then we can directly compare each action and check if something is wrong. 
Okay, good for us. The test passes, so which means that the loading uh, went fine. Um, okay, just as a bonus, but I think I already showed you in the slides. Uh, if you want to define and train a model in one line, it's also possible. For that, you need to have an environment that is registered in Jim and a policy which is registered, and we provide some default one. So the next part is about how to use Jim wrappers, and I've seen, in fact, some questions already, uh, which will be answered, uh, I think, by that part. So Jim wrappers are very it's something that you put around your environment and which would allow you to do many things like monitoring, normalization, uh, discretization, also from limit the number of time steps and do some feature augmentation or change the reward. And a gym wrapper in its essence, it's very simple. It's just like a gym environment. It has a reset and a step uh, method. The main difference with the environment is that the environment is passed as a parameters and then you can access it using self.env. And, and then you need to return um, the observation. Uh, again, the reset method need to return observation and the step method need to return uh, the table. And in between here, you can do many things. Uh, and this is the nice thing about Jim uh, wrappers is then you can reuse them and you can chain them. You can use multiple wrappers on one environment easily. And there's already many wrappers defined in Jim. And as Jim is not properly documented, you have to take a look at the GitHub repo and the code. But it's it's fairly simple to to see how it works. So the the um, the next things the next exercise for you will be to create a wrapper which is very useful, which is to limit the number of steps per episode. So to um, when you have I want to have some timeout. And, and for that, in fact, this wrapper is used by default in many gym environment. Um, and for you, the, the challenge will be to, to call it. So this will be a time limit wrapper, which will take as input the gym environment and the maximum number of steps that you want to do in this environment. For that, you will need to have a counter of the step number of steps per episode that you will need to reset at the same time that you reset your, your environment. And then in the step function, you need to step into the environment, increment your episode counter, and check if the counter is over the limit or not. And if it's over the limit, then you need to uh, stop the episode. So return, uh, say that uh, return done equal true. And optionally, if you have some time, you can also add a key to the information dictionary. Uh, if you recall, you have the information dictionary to tell the agent that this termination is due to timeout and should be treated uh, differently to a normal termination. Um, and for that, uh, you will have seven minutes. I hope it's clear enough. If there's something that is not clear what is uh, asked, uh, then please ask the question or also use the chat matrix. And of course, if you want to touch test your implementation. Uh, below, I've written some test code, so you can directly check that uh, both the episode length is correct. And if you have the time, you can fill the um, information dictionary and check that you properly pass the information that this termination was due to t timeout. So let's start the countdown and see you in seven minutes.
So there was a question about what does the uh, deterministic parameter really do and if it's related to epsilon greedy behavior. So as uh, written, I think, uh, by David, um, yes, so it's related to both epsilon greedy and to the fact that uh, some policies also uses a distribution over action. And when you use deterministic to true, for instance, if you use a Gaussian policy, you will use the, only the mean and not sample from the Gaussian policy. In the case of DQN, the deterministic parameter uh, will directly use the uh, argmax, argmax of your Q values. Uh, but you, if you set it to false, then it will be an epsilon greedy uh, policy. So the good question saying, if I save a model that uses a wrapper for running observation or reward normalization, are the running statistic also automatically saved? So if using the reinforcement learning zoo, it's automatically saved. Otherwise, you will need to do it on your own. And in fact, it's called VEC normalized, and there's some documentation um, about how to save and load those statistics. And it's, in fact, a very important and tricky thing not to forget. Uh, to load those statistics and also to froze to freeze those statistics as test time. So there's one question saying, if I have one custom environment and my second environment is just one line added in the step function, is there a way to do it writing all the step function? Yes. Um, the simple way would be to pass a parameter to your environment and that would activate or deactivate that line. And in fact, uh, this is called environment keyword argument that you can pass to the gym.make uh, function.
so let's see um how did it go that time let's do again a quick poll a if you succeeded and uh b if not and i would this time allow panelists to vote okay this went much much better than uh, the two last time so we have 80 percent people that managed to do it in time even more and yeah 15 percent so again for those who did not manage it's 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 not a problem it's a challenge it's normal and there will be a solution notebook at the end to do it call me okay so uh, let's see what it takes to actually uh, write that wrapper. So the first thing we need to do, as written in the comments, if, is defining um, a counter. So having something that will uh, count how many steps that we're done in one episode. So next thing we need to do is obviously reset the environment. So just call dev.env.reset. And then uh, here we need to also reset our environment counter. Next things we need to do is in the step function, um, well, we're just gonna step into the environment, getting the observation, the reward, uh, the done signal, and the information dictionary using the step method and the action provided by the agent. And then we simply need to increment uh, the number of steps for one episode. And if this number of steps is bigger than uh, what uh, of the timeout that we set, which is max steps here, we're going to say that the episode is over. So we set down to true. And we're going to update the information dictionary saying um, episode timeout, uh, adding a key, episode timeout, and set it to true. And this is normally all we need to do, and we're going to check that uh, right afterward. So here, uh, because the default pendulum environment, if you use gym.make, already wraps the environment using a time uh, limit wrappers, we need to directly import the environment from gym without using .make. And then we are going to use our own wrapper on it and see uh, how long does it take before uh, one episode is over and if uh, the output is correct also. And here we see that there's an infinite loop because uh, this should be self.env here and not just environment. And here we go. So I specify a maximum number of time step of 100. And uh, we can see that at the end, the information dictionary contain the correct key that says that uh, this um, environment was uh, resetted because of a timeout. And we can check with a different number of time step and check that still this uh, the length is correct. One important thing to note is this implementation is not completely uh, valid. Uh, here, this should be not uh, done because if at the very last time step of your uh, maximum number of steps, the environment is resetted, um, then you should you should not consider that as a timeout. Uh, but this is a detail, and in fact, this is implemented correctly in the wrapper provided by Jim, and you can take a look at it if you want. Here, the, the main idea was to give you an overview of how to code the wrapper and how to use also the information dictionary to pass um, information to, to the algorithms. Um, so that was it for Jim and the wrappers. And the next things we're going to see um, is called uh, callbacks. And this allow you to uh, do monitoring, to save checkpoints, to manipulate the model, and for instance, to also show progress bar. Uh, we have some documentation about callbacks in our stable business 3 documentation. 
And it's mainly uh, event driven. So you need to first import the base callback. And a callback with, will have different methods that will be uh, called at different events. So when the training starts, uh, on when we start collecting experience, when we stop collecting experience, and when we start um, and when we step into the environment. And the most important one for you will be um, stepping into the environment. So this is called right after calling uh, the step method on the environment. And this return a Boolean. Um, so if it's true, we continue training. And, and if it's false, you can stop training early. And the callbacks are also very powerful because they have access to many variables because they derive from that callback. They have access to many variables. So they have access to the reinforcement learning model. So they have access to the training environment. They have also uh, variables that are automatically updated, which is the number of time a callback was called, the number of time steps spent into in the environment. We are, there's also access to the logger if, if needed to log additional values. Um, you can find all that documentation in Stable Basin 3. Um, and to give you a quick example on how does a callback look like and how we can use it, here it's a very dummy callback where um, the second time it will be called, it will stop the training early. So if we can, we can give uh, infinite values here. So the first time it will set a variable to true and the second time it will stop training by returning false. And here normally if we don't use a callback, this will train forever. But here it will stop very uh, fast because the callback will have an effect on uh, the agent. And so the next exercise that I have for you is something again very useful in reinforcement learning because training can be unstable and you also would like for instance to take a look at the stepping stone of, uh, of your agent on how did the learning progress. And for that you should usually not need to save a regular checkpoint of your model. And the way to do that in Stable Bayesian 3 is to use a checkpoint callback, and that's what you're going to implement today. Uh, so it takes as input different things. It takes the save frequency. So uh, how often do you want to save your uh, reinforcement learning agent? It takes as input where you want to save your model. What is the prefix of all checkpoints? and whether you, you want to print additional information when you save it, if you want to be variables or not. Uh, for that, you will need to, have, uh, to use variables that are already accessible in the callback, like a self.model. Um, you can take a look above at custom callback to, to know all the variables that you can have access to. And the first thing you need to do is will be initialize your callback by creating um, the save folder if needed. And for that, you will need to use os.makedears from Python. Um, and this would also prevent the agent to crash when it will try to save to a, to a folder that may not exist. And then in the step method, what you will need to do is check if uh, it's time to save or not the checkpoint and then uh, save the model as we have done previously. And optionally, you can um, print a message if we are in the variables mode. And to check that, I've written again some code here uh, to check your callback. I hope it's clear. If you have any question, again, you can write them. And for that, you will have uh, eight minutes. Let me set the countdown. And let's go. There's a question asking if uh, the gym environment or SB3 keep track of observation reward of, uh, or action history. No, they do not, but you can write a wrapper for that. And in fact, in the reinforcement learning zoo, we have a history wrapper uh, for it. In the callback is a logger, the same used as in the monitor. 
Uh, I think it's no, the, the logger is a stable Bayesian three logger that will be used to print things to the terminal and also print uh, output things to TensorBoard, for instance. But monitor is only here to save statistics that will be then used by the logger of stable Bayesian three. A uh, good question, when do you have to use callback instead of wrappers? So usually you need to, to use callbacks when you need access to the model or when you want to modify um, yeah, the, the training behavior. Um, for instance, we have uh, something called evaluation callback, which, which allow to evaluate the model periodically. And here, as you need access to the model and the environment, then you can use a callback. Wrapper are mostly for things only and related to the environment that can be reused between two environments.
So the, the question saying, is it possible to say trailing loss via custom callback instead of tensible logger? Um, yeah, it's possible, but the best way would be in fact to define a custom logger or to uh, save the logs, uh, the logger output uh, somewhere else automatically. Right. Let's see how it go for that one. This one is probably a bit more trickier than the other one as it's uh, something completely new. So A is you succeeded in time, B is you're still fighting with the code. Okay. 60-40%. Okay, it's mitigated. All right. So, of course, if something was not clear, um, don't hesitate to ask a question first on the matrix. And if uh, it cannot be answered, then also directly on Zoom. Um, yep. So let's stop the poll. And let's see how to do that checkpoint callback. So, um, here in the init, we don't need to do much because most of the job is done, in fact, by uh, the base callback for us and all the variables that is needed for us is already saved there. First thing we need to do is um, create the, the, the folder where we want to save all our uh, checkpoints and for that we're going to call uh, os.makedears using uh, the pass that was uh, provided by the user. And here we say also that if it exists, we should not throw an error. Uh, the next things we want to do is check if it's time to save uh, the model. So for that, we just uh, check how many times this check, uh, check callback was called. So number of calls as shown in the documentation is already um, included in the callback and updated automatically. So if uh, the number of calls is uh, correspond to the uh, save frequency that we want, then we're going to save our uh, our callback. And for that, we need to create uh, this, uh, the pass where we want to save. Uh, so the file name is you start with um, the pass to the folder where want, you want to uh, save the checkpoints. And then it's a mix of the prefix uh, for each checkpoint and the score. And here, because we want each checkpoint to be unique, um, we're going to use uh, the number of uh, time step already in the environment. And again, this variable is, auto is automatically updated uh, in the callback. And in fact, the complete name will be uh, with a zip. Uh, next things we need to do is actually uh, save the model. So for that, we just have access to self.model and call save on it using the file name. Um, and then we can uh, print um, if we are in verbose mode. So if verbose is bigger, uh, positive, strictly positive, then we can print that we are saving 
uh, saving checkpoint checkpoint and then what we do is we also can uh, out print the path where we are saving the checkpoint file name here and that's mostly all you need to do and let's check actually if it's working so here we just inst instantiate our callback uh, and pass it to our policy. And there's apparently some errors because OS has no attribute join, it's os.pass.join. Um, so here what's happening is we are training uh, an A2C agent on card pool for 5,000 time step. And every 1,000 time step, we hope that we will save a checkpoint of it. And if we list all the file in the in the folder we wanted to uh, to create and to save the checkpoint, we can see that we have uh, the different uh, the five checkpoints that we wanted. Is self num timestamp self rec uh, div um, so there's a question of whether I should use end calls or uh, num time step here. And the reason I'm using end calls is because when you have multiple environments in parallel, this will not be the same and this will be, be more much trickier to uh, to use. So that's why I'm using a number of calls here and not a number of time step. Okay, any more question? Then um, the next things I would like to show you, um, I don't know, David, how much time more do we have? Because if we don't have much time, then I will skip the next part. Well, on the schedule, you are planned until uh, one o'clock. Ah, then we are fine. Um, perfect. So the next things I would like to talk about, uh, oh, before I, I skip to the next part, obviously, uh, because callbacks are very useful and especially for instance, the checkpoint callback or the evaluation callback where you want to evaluate your model uh, regularly are very useful. We have already those implemented in Stable Baseline 3 and you can check the documentation for what's in there. Um, so the next things I would like to talk about is multiprocessing and what's called vectorized environment. So, so far we have been using only one environment to collect uh, samples. Uh, but in fact, we could use, make use of multiprocessing and using multiple environments at the same time. And this has different benefits. One is uh, you can collect uh, more data uh, faster and the experience collected by the, the different workers uh, will be more diverse. But there are usually a trade-off between uh, the wall clock time uh, and also um, uh, the sample efficiency. So usually when you use multiple workers, it will be less sample efficient, but it will train faster in, team, in term of wall clock time. And Stable Baseline provides you with two uh, implementation. One is called a dummy vec amp, which is just a for loop on the different environment you want to use for a worker. And it's already a good start. And the other one is using uh, processes. The thing is because of communication delay and um, Processes, uh, most of the time, this one is slower than just using a for loop uh, over the environment. And to be a little bit more clear on how, um, uh, how a vectorized environment work, I want to make a quick drawing. Okay, that was already ready. So a gym environment is uh, mostly composed of two, two functions, a reset uh, method and a step method. And what we do is when using vectorized environment, we just use independent copies uh, of the environment and we encapsulate it into a bigger structure that we call vectorized environment. So we, we just mostly uh, copy uh, the environment but they remain independent, otherwise we will collect the same data. And then around it, uh, we, have, uh, we have something called a vectorized environment. And this is, and the simplest way of doing that is just having a list of environments 
and doing a for loop around it. And this is what the dummy vec env is doing. And um, also the, the vec env is uh, also presenting a reset as also a reset and a step method. But compared to the other one, uh, they return a batch of observation and return a batch of everything because they are managing several environments at the same time. Um, and to give you a quick example on how faster it can be, uh, I will compare training with only one environment versus training uh, with uh, multiple environments. Here I'm using PPO with one environment and it will take around 20 uh, seconds to train. And I need to adjust the number of steps here because the number of steps um, should be divided by the number of environment if you want to be independent of the number of environment that you are using. So it's training. And once it's done, we can uh, print how long it took. And then we compare it to using, instead of using only one environment, you can use here from 16 environments. Um, and to make, yeah, to, to make the comparison possible, I'm dividing also the number of steps here by 16. Uh, MacVecAnv is also a utility function already available in Stable Design to easily create uh, multiple copies uh, given one uh, ID or given one class. And here we see it's going to take uh, it's going to be much faster. But the scaling, as you will see, is not linear. It's not taking it's not sixteen times faster. And in fact, you the the low at some point you will have some. Uh, trouble with that, but still the improvement, the speed up is quite good. So how do you define the number of environment to use when dealing with a new problem environment? Um, well, it depends on your problem. If I'm using a robot, usually I only have uh, one robot. And it's, it relates also to what I presented in the first part. It, what does matter for you? Um, does work like training matter for you or does sample efficiency matter for you? So if I want to quickly see if I can solve the environment and giving it a maximal budget, so infinite budget, then I would use as many environment as possible until I reaches, um, I reach the, the limit of communication delay and I don't get uh, gain anything in terms of workload time. Um, but it depends also on the algorithms, but usually, uh, it, it also depends on your machine fonts. If you have eight cores, you should not use more than eight environment or 16 environments. Uh, but if you have more cores, then you can probably parallelize it more. How does SB3 handle batch transition in the buffer rollout? Um, so currently in the replay buffer, we only support um, uh, one environment, but to support multiple environments, one simple fix would be just to do a for loop to store all the new transition from all environment. And for a rollout a buffer, when we are using a PPU or A2C, um, we, we, we just have uh, an, an additional dimension for the number of, of environment. And then we, we are just a bit careful when you compute, uh, for instance, the return and the advantage, we are careful at that moment when we reshaped everything uh, to be sampled by the, by the agent. But basically, uh, so for the replay buffer, it's not supported yet, but it would be just a for loop. And for on policy algorithm, it's just additional dimension. How do the multiple environment deal with action choice? Can we have different policies? Um, so you could, in theory, have different policies, but the way it works, uh, at least during exploration, uh, as because it's sampled from a stochastic, it usually it's sampled from the exploration policy, so the stochastic policy, even though it's the same policy, because you will sample from different uh, environment initialized differently with stochastic action, you will have different action with the same policy. Okay. I made n step equal n step divided by 16. Doesn't mean that each amp use less iteration than if you use only one environment. Does it affect the policy improvement? Um, so here, the next n step, because it's on policy algorithm, it's uh, the batch size, the total number of um, 
samples that you will use uh, during one policy update, and then you will have to discard them because it's on policy. I just use here uh, divided by 16 to make it comparable. And usually the bigger, the better, but then uh, it will take longer to train. It, it will be more stable because you will have more st samples to approximate the gradient, but it will also take longer to train. Okay, so now we are coming to the, to the end of this tutorial. And I would like to finish uh, with a challenge. So I would like to show you the importance of hyperparameter tuning and the, also the importance of not tuning it by hand, if you can use automatic tuning. And this, this challenge, I call it grad student descent. And your uh, task will be to compete against automatic hyperparameter tuning to find the best hyperparameters for A to C on the card pool version one, so with 500 time step problem, with a budget. This is the tricky part. The budget is limited to 20,000 time step. And um, the maximum reward that you can have per episode is 500, and this is the goal uh, for you. Um, and obviously, A to C, in fact, it's quite sensible to the random sin, and the goal would be to have also hyperparameters that not only work for one seed, but that work for multiple random seeds. Um, so for that, I will, uh, so the budget is 20,000 time step. And let's see how the default hyperparameters uh, does. And you will see that the default are okay. So they, it learns something, but you, you don't reach the maximal uh, performance in, in the minimal amount of step. So let's see, it's half training is done. Um, and, and choosing good hyperparameters is usually a key to success in uh, reinforcement learning. And um, for instance, off policy algorithm are more or less, the fonts TD3 and ACC are more or less uh, equally good. It's mostly a question of hyperparameter between the two. So here we see that with default hyperparameters, we get um, I mean, reward around 85, which is much better than random, but still far away from the optimal policy. And this is mostly due because of, of the small budget. Um, so the task for you will be to tune uh, those parameters. You will have 15 uh, minutes for that. And here, what I've shown here are, in fact, the default hyperparameter used in stable baselines. So this is uh, the network archi architecture, for both for the actor, pi, and the critic, so the value function. Uh, we are using orthogonal initialization by default, and the activation function is hyperbolic tangent. Uh, then in the hyperparameters is the number of steps uh, between each gradient update. You can choose, uh, this is the learning rate, uh, and gamma is a discount factor, so the discount factor for the environment. There's additional uh, variable, which is lambda, which is related to lambda returns, if you recall the lecture, uh, which is basically a trade-off between bias and variance. And currently, we have some gradient uh, clipping. In fact, it's normalizing the gradient. Uh, it makes things more stable, but it's also more conservative. So this value is quite conservative. And by making it bigger, you will have a faster training, but it will make it more unstable. And finally, another coefficient that you can tune is the entropy coefficient, which is which can give a bonus for exploration to the agent. Um, even if it's zero, because the initial variance is not zero, it will still explore, but it may converge quickly or too quickly uh, to a deterministic policy. And this is what this factor allow you to, to change. Um, so your goal will be to change those hyperparameters and then to evaluate it and try to reach uh, the maximal uh, performance of 500. And to help you, uh, because you will be competing against a script of aut automatic hyperparameter tuning, I gave you here some advices on what are good ranges uh, for uh, those parameters. Uh, it's, it's recommended. You can obviously choose values outside those values, but usually those values are, um, are working on those range of value are the recommended ones, 
but you can uh, try other things. So for instance, here, usually trying a tangent, a hyperbolic tangent and redo is good enough, but if you want to try something more fancy, like a switch activation function, you can do it. Um, and here, uh, when it says, uh, here, for instance, it's gamma. Gamma is usually chosen close to one, and uh, the learning rate is chosen between minus uh, one to the point minus five and one. And you have all those um, all, all those recommended uh, ranges here. And then I will both start the timer and my script at the same time. And we will see. So let's start the script. And the goal for you, yeah, is to, to find the best set of hyperparameters. And for that, you will have 15 minutes, which are starting now. I'm also showing you here my script. Um, it will display what is uh, the best um, set of hyperparameters uh, found so far and uh, it's associated episodic value. Don't look at the values because they are a bit defined differently in my script, but you can uh, have an idea on how fast it can find a good hyperparameter. So good luck. So we have our first trial from the automatic script, which ended up with a physical reward of 71. We are, so we are still far away from 500. But here, for now, it's mostly random. Oh, it already found a good run with uh, more than 400 episodic reward. It's mostly random, but then it's using, behind the hood, it's using Bayesian optimization and a pruner to select um, the parameters that are most probable to yield good values. So there's a question about a good question about Optina on how does it select the combination of of parameters 
first randomly and later based on first result? Yes, exactly. So it, de it depends on your sampling. So hyperparameter tuning is based on two things. There's a sampler which decides which combination to try and there's a pruner which decides when we should stop um, a trial early. And here what I'm using is Bayesian optimization. So yes, it will start randomly and then based on the first result, it will uh, sample the hyperparameters that are most likely to give the best result. However, however, when you change the coefficient gamma, it changes the total reward, how the total reward is cal calculated. Um, no, so gamma is only used in the algorithm. It's the objective that the algorithm is optimizing, but when we evaluate um, the, the agent, we are not using gamma, we are using the total reward. And in fact, that's also the main difference, for instance, between reinforcement learning and evolution strategy. Evolution strategy directly optimize uh, for um, the total episodic reward, uh, not the discounted one. Nice. We have uh, someone, we already found some, uh, a good set of hyperparameters. So Tibok, <laughs> you should, did you try with multiple SID? And if it worked with multiple SID, then it would be nice afterward to post um, the hyperparameters that you found. Not not yet, but at the end, I think it would be interesting to to see what type uh, what hyperparameters worked quite well. So there's a quick question about the policy keyword argument. So those policy keyword argument are used at the moment uh, the policy is created and it's passed, um, it is passed to the policy. And in fact, the, the policy is an, a, an object that is containing, um, here we do an abuse of language because it's containing both the actor and the critic and the optimizer. Um, and that's where the policy keyword argument is used. And it seems that after 16 trial, the script already found some lucky, well, not lucky, but good hyperparameters, at least for one seed.
And today I'm a bit more disadvantaged because you are, uh, I think, more than 100 uh, trying hyperparameters in parallel. I only have three environments in parallel. And because of Zoom and everything, my computer is much slower than usual. So it can do much less trial. So there's a question on how many evaluation episodes you should use to justify if, if policy is good or not. Well, it depends on your environment and how stochastic is your environment, but usually at least 10. Here I use 50 and 100 to be uh, very sure and because the environment is small and very fast to run, but sometimes the environment is slower to run, so you cannot afford doing 50 evaluation trials. So there's different people that have good trials, but that work well only on one seat. And, and in fact, that's uh, showing you, yeah, a classic things with RL is that it depends on, on the random seat. And here it's especially true for A to C. For PPO, it will be less a problem, but still um, it, it, it will happen. The seat is a hyperparameters, uh, kind of. <laughs> No, in, 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 in practice, it should not be, but that's why you should have a quantitative evaluation. So it seems that the, uh, the script I found not only one set, but at least one, two, three, three set of hyperparameters that yielded 500, so I think what we can do later on would be um, taking a look at the um, at the log and seeing what are, what is in common between those successful trials. And by analyzing the report, you will also analyze uh, what is which hyperparameter is important and which range of value is acceptable or not. And in fact, at the end of the training, it will generate. Um, uh, two graphs, two graphs showing you uh, the importance of hyperparameter, and also um, showing you the history of of trials. But it's already getting quite good. Uh, several results, about five hundred, and three at least three sets with uh, five hundred. Now four. So thirty seconds left. <laughs> Take your favorite seed.
Okay, time's up. Let's. Uh, I will let you finish your last run, and then um, I will do some polls to see how many of you did at least find one good run. Let's wait some seconds. So the first poll will be about if you got at least one red uh, above above uh, two hundred. So if you have above 200, uh, you write A. If you have below 200, uh, you write B. And normally, yeah, m most of you manage at least to find a lucky run. OK, I will wait for 60 votes, probably. We are at 52. Yeah, so mo most of you could find at least one run above um, 200. Um, now let's stay, let's uh, relaunch the question and now who is above 300? Okay, still more or less the same proportion. So 80% managed to find hyperparameters above 300. Okay, uh, next is about 400 and uh, so now it's 400 and the last one will be if you manage to reach the perfect score. So 400, it's getting a bit less, 60% more or less, which is still quite a good, oh, 70%. So yeah, two set of you already managed to find good runs. Okay, and now who managed to, how many of you managed to have at least for one seat a perfect score? Oh, interesting. It's half, half of the people, uh, yeah, a little half, like 40% managed to, to have something running. And and my last poll will be for those of you who managed to find something that work. Um, uh, did it work with multiple seats or not? And that would be my last poll before I show you a bit the results and what we can do with hyperparameter tuning. Okay, we have 50-50, so that's quite good. Um, and the last one is, did it work on multiple seats? At least, at least on two, three seats. Okay, so most of you, 30% have good ones that work on multiple seats and 70% are just one lucky run for a particular seat. And for those who uh, manage to have multiple seats um, working, I would ask you probably to share your hyperparameters in the matrix chat, um, but using, don't forget you, to use code formatting uh, otherwise, it will be uh, hard to read. So I think it's using Markdown. So you need to use triple uh, back uh, tick to properly format your uh, your code. And here, what I'm showing you uh, to you currently is uh, what the uh, script did. And each blue dot is each trial. So at the beginning, it's random trials, but in fact, it found one lucky one here. And then it started uh, sampling uh, more uh, better and better hyperparameters. And um, and what you see is when it has found good hyperparameters, then it will prune a lot of trials because uh, then it knows what what is possible to reach as performance and not. So it will prune many trials here, and then it will uh, find uh, again um, other samples that work uh, well in that case. And this is automatically, so I had to do nothing. I mostly, mostly had to do to define the search space, but the search space, you define it for one algorithm and then you can let it run while you're sleeping uh, for a while and then come back. And the other thing that this, uh, this software can give you, Optuna can give you some hyperparameter importance. So here, what you can see is that 
changing uh, the clipping, the gradient clipping was quite important to have, I think, fast result. Um, but you should not take that all those uh, hyperparameter importance as granted because the we used only I think it was only using uh, it only did forty trials, so to have a real hyperparameter importance, I would uh, let it run for much longer. And also the entropy coefficient was apparently important, and I think the entropy coefficient should be close to zero. Uh, let's see, yes, the entropy coefficient of the best trial is close to zero, which is expected because in that case here, you would like to converge to a deterministic policy, which is balancing the pole perfectly. Um, so the script, uh, the script in fact is available in the repo. So if you go in the repo and in Optuna, the script is called SB3Simple and I've saved also uh, inside the optimization history. And basically what it does, I just rewrote it the search space of the different hyperparameters. And I'm using a callback uh, to evaluate uh, the agent and decide if it should be pruned or not. So here yeah, the callback is quite simple and it's very useful. And then I just define uh, my agent and ask uh, Optuna, um, ask Optuna here. So using a Bayesian optimization sampler and a median pruner, I just ask Optuna to optimize my objective function, which is um, here having maximal uh, reward. And and at the end, I can save the study and print, plot the different uh, things. And this trip is included in the repo. Okay, and to show you uh, from a previous run some hyperparameters that work on from my uh, that came from the script. So this was from the script. Let me copy paste it. Yes, um, and it worked on so on the seed eight. I think it worked quite well, but it worked also on different seeds. Uh, and I need to define the neural network here. And what's mostly important, I think in those upper parameters here is a small network is a big, bigger network than one, just one hidden layer is not required. Um, you need more steps apparently to better approximate the gradient. Usually all my successful trials have a bigger number of time steps. And because you want to be less conservative, because you have a small budget, the gradient uh, norm is uh, the clipping is is higher. And also, the I think the learning rate is higher to try to learn faster. So let's see in the chat what was outputted. Uh, so that was in the chat. There was a higher, uh, also higher gradient norm, but no, not much changes. And yeah, usually I've, I've seen, at least in the chat, what I see is using a small architecture, uh, more, more, more steps to approximate the gradient. So the default number of steps, I think is five, and I've seen uh, six and 10, higher learn, uh, learning rate and higher gradient clipping. Okay, so um, this was mainly to show you the importance of hyperparameter tuning and the importance of not doing you on your own. So obviously after doing it automatically, you can take a look at the hyperparameters and try to interpret and see what's working on different one, but you should not spend too much time on it. Um, another thing is uh, we provide, so I've provided a simple example that is also included in the Optina, um, Optina repo. And this hyperparameter tuning is also included in the reinforcement learning zoo. So again, and this is a training framework when you, once you know a bit more about stable Bayesian three, which has um, automatic uh, hyperparameter tuning included. Uh, tuning. 
So for instance, you can directly ask uh, for PPU for an environment. Um, you just call optimize how many trials you want, how many job in parallel you want to do, and what type of sampler could could it be random? Could it be year Bayesian optimization? And what type of pruner you want? And it will automatically um, do the hyperparameter optimization for you. So this is the end of today's session. So what we have seen so far, we have seen um, Stable Base 3 101. So how to get started with Stable Base 3, its basic API, how to use it. Uh, we have seen how to create a gym wrapper to change uh, our environment or to, for instance, to limit the number of time steps. Um, we have seen how to use Stable Base 3 callback to interact with the RL agent without changing the code of the RL agent. I've shown you a quick demo of multi-processing using multiple environments in parallel to make uh, training faster in terms of work clock, work clock time. Um, and uh, we have finished with a small challenge showing you the importance of good hyperparameter tuning. Uh, before we go, I think there's uh, there was probably there's two questions, I think. Op automatic tuning uses one seed per trial. Yes, that's true. And um, in, in fact, it's it would be better to use multiple seed per trial, but then it will take more time to optimize. And considering a fixed budget for the tuning process, is it better to run the maximum tuning trial if I could? Or would it better to use less trial and more than one seed per trial? So usually what I do when I optimize for an environment is I don't optimize for the full budget that I will use at the end. I optimize for a smaller portion of it, which allow me to, to do more trials. And usually the, um, uh, the trials that work well at the beginning of training also tend to work well at the end. It's not always the case, but if you give sufficient budget, but not the full budget, it's usually a good start.